Well, it seems that we are live now on YouTube. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome our guests and our audience to the second Mind Brazil Brainstorms. If you are watching us through YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. The Mind Brazil Brainstorms is a series of quarterly online roundtables. In each roundtable, we discuss the work of an eminent philosopher working in the philosophy of mind with a very special group of debaters. The series was conceived by a group of Brazilian philosophers, including me, Rodrigo Gouveia and Gabriel Mograbi from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Gustavo Leo Toledo and Marco Aurelio Souza Alves from the Federal University of São João del Rey, and Samuel Bellini Leite from the State University of Minas Gerais. This event is being transmitted live in, on YouTube. At the end, there will be time for questions from the audience. Before presenting our guests, I would like to acknowledge the support from ANPOF, Associação Nacional de Pós-Graduação em Filosofia, and the working groups GT Filosofia da Mente e da Informação, and GT Filosofia da Neurociência, Cognição, XFI e Neuroética. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank our guests for accepting our invitation. It is a great pleasure and honor to have you here. Uh, David Papineau is our special guest and target of today's event. He is currently Professor of Philosophy of Science at King's College London and Visiting Presidential Professor at the Graduate Center of the, of the City University of New York. He was President of the British Society for Philosophy of Science, President of, of the Mind Association and President of the Aristotelian Society. David Papineau is the author of many books. Amongst them, I mention Thinking About Consciousness from 2003, Philosophical Devices, Proofs, Probabilities, Possibilities and Sets from 2012, Knowing the Score, How Sports Teaches About Philosophy and Philosophy About Sports from 2017, and The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience, the target of our discussion today, which was published March this year. Michel Montague is professor at the Department of Philosophy of the University of Texas at Austin. Her book, The Given, Experience and Its Content, was published in 2016. She also co-edited the books Cognitive Phenomenology from 2011 and Non-Propositional Intentionality from 2018. Ka Kathleen Farkas, is professor, of the is professor at the Department of Philosophy of the Central European University, which I think is currently in Vienna. She is also visiting professor at the MAP, the Research Master in Metaphysics and Mind in Lugano. Kathleen Farkas currently serves as the president of the European Society for Analytic Philosophy. Her book, The Subject's Point of View, was published in 2008 and she's currently working on a book called The Unity of Knowledge. Francisco Pereira is currently associate professor at the philosophy department of Universidad Alberto Hurtado, located in Santiago, Chile. He currently serves as the president of the Asociación Latinoamericana de Filosofía Analítica, Alfan. Francisco Pereira has published two books, David Hume, Naturaleza, Conocimiento y Metafísica, from 2009, and Ver o Alucinar, Una Mirada Introductoria a la Filosofía de la Percepción, from 2019. Sergio Farias de Souza Filho is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the graduate program Logic and Metaphysics of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. He did his PhD at King's College London under the supervision of David Papineau. He published papers and book chapters in the philosophy of mind, philosophy of biology, and philosophy of language. Roberto Horacio de Sapereira is currently professor at the Department of Philosophy of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and member of the graduate program Logic and Metaphysics. 
He's also a Saint Piquet researcher. Robert Horacio published many papers and book chapters, most of them about topics in the philosophy of mind, especially consciousness and perception. But he also published in epistemology, history of philosophy, especially Kant, philosophy of action, and other areas. Let me now present the structure of the debate. First, David will make a short opening statement. Then each debater will have 10 to 15 minutes for questions. After David's response, others can present follow-up questions. In order to inform me that you wish to jump in the debate, just write F in the private chat. For the rounds of the debate, I will follow the alphabetical order. So first, Francisco will be asking his questions, then Catalin, Michel, Roberto, and Sergio. Well, thank you very much again for being here. It is an honor, as I said, to have you all. And thank you very much, David, for accepting our invitation and being part of this event. I will uh, uh, give you the word. The word is yours, David. You may start with your opening statements. OK. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, it's a very pleasant occasion for me. Can I just check one thing before we start? It's alpha, the the question is going to be alphabetical by given name, first, yeah. by first name. Very good. Okay, now I'm clear. All right, so I should start off by giving a brief outline of what's in the book. So let me let me do that and try and stick to ten minutes. So the book defends a particular account of the nature of sensory experiences, conscious sensory experiences, the kind of properties we enjoy when we have visual experience or oral experience or tactile experience. And the line I defend is that these properties are intrinsic qualitative properties of people. And I defend this position mainly against what I take to be the dominant view in the philosophy of perception nowadays, which is representationalism. So representationalists think that sensory experiences by their nature represent the world beyond the mind. Uh, I say, I say no, uh, sensory experiences are intrinsic qualitative states that have no essential connection to matters beyond the mind. Uh, perhaps I can focus the issue by saying a bit more about what representationalism is in the in the philosophy of perception. It's not the view, though this isn't always clear in literature, just that sensory experiences are representations. I mean, I think sensory experiences are representations. I think our sensory experiences are typically prompted by certain features of the external world and guide our behavior in a way appropriate to those features. And to that extent, yes, of course, they're, they're representations. But I don't think the experiences are essentially representational, and that's what representationalists in the philosophy of perception think. So when I talk about representationalism today, I'm going to mean the stronger view that experiences are essentially representational, not the view that I share, which, as it happens, sensory experiences are indeed representations. I mean, this might sound a slightly fine-tuned issue, but, but I can bring it out by considering the analogy I use in the book with words. So. Take the example I have in, in the introduction. Take the sentence, the English sentence. Uh, Elvis, Presley, Elvis Presley once visited Paris. Okay, that sentence, those, that sequence of sounds, uh, or if I wrote it down, sequence of marks, uh, represents. It's, it says that Elvis visited Paris. It's true if he did and false if he didn't. And as it happens, I don't know which, which, it, which it is. But those words clearly aren't essentially representational. I mean, they might have represented something different, or they might have well have represented nothing at all. It's, it's in virtue of the way they're used by the community of English speakers that they represent what they do. And that fact that they're used as they are by the English speakers is a contingent add-on to the nature of the words as marks. Okay, my view is that sensory experiences are just like words. They do, as it happens, represent certain features of the external world for subjects, 
but it's not built into their nature as conscious experiences that they should do so. Uh, now that he's not perfect, I mean, the, when they do represent, as, as, as in fact they do, it's not in virtue of the way they're used by the Committee of English Speakers, obviously, rather it's in virtue of the way that they are embedded in certain environmental structures. But I say uh, the analogy is good to this extent, that the fact they are so embedded in, in uh, environments and correlated with certain external properties isn't built into their nature as, as conscious sensory experiences. It's a contingent, contingent add-on. So I mean, just to focus the issue even further, let's do the cosmic brain in a vat, because perhaps you'll come back to that in the discussion at various points. So uh, cosmic, cosmic swamp brain. Uh, uh, out in outer space, uh, in the vacuum, by quantum uh, mechanical freak, a perfect replica of my brain, filled and surrounded by a sustaining vat, uh, coagulates in, in, in uh, mid-space, and, and physically is just like my brain for the next 15 minutes. All the same uh, uh, inputs to uh, sensory cortex, all the same signals coming out from the motor cortex, but it's just a brain in a vat. Now, I take it, I mean, some will dispute this, but I think this is kind of agreed on both sides that I'm talking about now, that that being will have the same conscious experiences as I do. So, you know, it's, it's having a conscious experience as of a, as of a yellow ball. Uh, uh, does that sensory experience represent? I say no, it's just, it's just Marx. It's just like the words Elvis Presley was once in Paris, uh, written on the mountains of Mars. Uh, it doesn't have any connection with, with any further, further facts. But the representationalists will say, no, no, quite independently of the fact it's not I mean, any correlations with the environment, just you can read off from the nature of the sensory experience. It's saying to that, that uh, cosmic brain and a vat, that there's a yellow ball in front of it. So that's that's the difference. Uh, I think the experiences are just just signs that need something else to breathe meaning into them. Uh, and the representations of opponents think that just in virtue of their conscious nature, they already have have a meaning. Okay, so that's that's the issue. Uh, there's a lot of setting up in the book, but in chapter two, I I argue against representationalism. And I start off by targeting those representationalists who appeal to the idea of transparency. But let's skip that. What's doing the work here I, is these representationalists, the ones I target in the first place, think that when I have an experience as of a yellow ball, the property of yellowness and roundness, the worldly properties that balls can have, those properties are present in my experience. Literally, those properties are part of my experience. And I argue that this makes no good sense. And the way to drive home the fact it makes no good sense is that representationalists are common factor theorists. They're not like naive realists. They think that the, the Conscious sensory properties involved in my seeing yellow ball are present equally in the case where I'm suffering an illusion or hallucination and I'm looking at a green ball, I'm looking at, at nothing. But they say even in that case, the properties of yellowness around us are present in our experience, even when you're in a bad case and there's no, there's no yellowness, maybe no roundness in front of you. And I say now, this view is very weird. This view is somehow... The conscious nature of my experience is constituted by my being in some kind of relation to the uninstantiated property of yellowness up in whatever space properties live in. Uh, look, nothing in front of me is yellow. I'm not yellow. My brain's not yellow. Nothing is yellow. Yet somehow yellowness is already present in my experience. And I say I find it hard to make sense of this view. And in particular, it seems to... Uh, be in tension with the here and now nature of conscious experience. When I have a certain conscious experience, this is to do with how it is for me here and now, and this idea that that's the same as my being related to some 
property out in property space, uh, that's not here and now enough. In the book, I then, I then develop and generalize this argument so it becomes an argument not just against the view that conscious sensory properties are relations to uninstantiated properties, but more generally, it's against the view that conscious sensory experiences are instantiations of representational properties. And some people will think that conscious sensory experiences represent, even though they don't in any sense involve the property of yellowness or roundness. And I say, look, if we think about what is a representational property, it itself is a rather abstract relation. My representing something to be a certain way is a matter of my being related to a proposition, something which transcends actuality, uh, might be true or false. Being related to a proposition doesn't look like the kind of thing that can have the causes and effects that my conscious experiences have. And so I end up in the chapter arguing that the whole idea of representationalism is hopeless because representational properties and conscious properties are incommensurable. Representational properties uh, are a matter of, of relations to abstract, uh, not the kinds of things that enter into causal relations, whereas conscious sensory properties, I take it, clearly do enter into causal relations. So, so much for representationalism. Uh, at this point, I've been arguing against representationists and taking them to be people who think that sensory experiences, by their conscious nature, independently of any contingent uh, surroundings, have truth conditions. They lay down a condition for the will to satisfy and their, their accurate vertical truth if the will satisfies that condition and not. So, so that's the target of the argument in chapter two. People who think that sensory experiences uh, are essentially a matter of having, having certain truth conditions. But they're people in the kind of intentionalist camp, representationalist camp, who want to think that sense experiences are intrinsically intentional, directed, maybe not representational. But don't think of this as a matter of having, having truth conditions. And you know, Brian Law, I put in this camp, Angela, Angela Mendelevici, Uriah Kriegel, and some of the things he says, and I guess Cotty and Michelle are, I can see Cotty kind of, maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. I, uh, 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 maybe that's something you might want to defend. And, and in effect, chapter three is a criticism of that line of view, that there's some sense short of having truth conditions and that sense experiences are essentially directed, world-pointing, intentional. And what I say in chapter three is that I agree that sensory experience is richly structured, and uh, I draw on some work by, by Cotty to explain this, and I say that it's being richly structured in the way it is, uh, makes it very seductive, very attractive to suppose it's essentially representational, perhaps in virtue of the fact that it makes it seductive to suppose that it involves, sensory experience involves worldly properties. But what I say in chapter, chapter three is if you uh, uh, look at the nature of this seductive spiel, what it is that's seducing you into this view, it turns out that the line of thought involves various fallacies and confusions. So while I will grant that sensory experience uh, by its nature seems representational in the sense that it invites you to think of it, invites us to believe that it's representational, uh, I don't think you can infer from that that it really is in any sense representational because the line of argument that leads us to that belief is, is fallacious. So that's chapter two. I'm going to stop in a second. and. Uh, Chapter three is just uh, squaring my view with various issues that might seem problematic for it. So I talk uh, a bit about introspection. I talk about the ways in which we talk in English and other languages about experiences. 
and I talk about rich contents, the kinds of contents I think experiences are capable of having. And that's it. That's the end of the book. And that's my that's my summary. So I'll I'll stop there. Thank you very much, David, for your, your statements, for the presentation of the book. I will now start the debate. Uh, as, I, as I said, there will be different rounds. And uh, the first one to, to ask his questions will be Francisco. But let me just warn the audience that there will be time after the rounds of the debate uh, for them to, to ask questions. They will just have to write them down in the chat of our YouTube uh, video channel, and and then at the end, Marco Aurelio, who is at the backstage, will will read them. Well, uh, in order to start the debate, I'll give the word to Francisco Pereira. Please, you may jump in. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank thank David for for his introduction, and and thanks for the invitation to Rodrigo, Marco Aurelio, and, and Gabriel. This is a, a great event and a very focused event in this, this particular time on, on Davis' uh, new book. Um, I want to focus my, my comments or, or question, uh, questions on two issues. I'm going to start with some, some topics that uh, David mentions in Chapter 2. Uh, basically, when, when he's sort of uh, arguing against uh, representationalism, and uh, if we think one of one of the sort of prima facie attractions of uh, representationalism in general is that uh, we can uh, account for the sensory character of uh, hallucinatory experiences without um, committing ourselves with uh, odd ontologies, such as the ontology included in the sense data tradition, uh, ontology of non-physical objects. So traditional representationalists uh, argue that there is indeed a common factor between the so-called uh, good cases, uh, successful perceptions, and the so-called bad cases, um, uh, hallucinations mainly. Uh, there's a whole debate whether we include illusions in, in one category or the other, but I'm going to include it, illusions myself in the successful case because at least we are in, in relation with, with an object and perhaps we are just misrepresenting one of the properties of the object. So, so one of the attractions is that we can make sense of that common factor in fully representational terms. Uh, it seems to me that there is a, a red apple floating in the space because I'm representing such thing. And one of the, the, the warriors that follows from uh, David's own uh, positive account is that if we want to make sense of the bad cases in terms of the presence of properties, some representationalists appeal to the idea of uh, uninstantiated properties. So when, when I hallucinate, I explain the appearance, I explain how things look to me, qualitatively speaking, on the basis of uh, representational content that includes as a component an uninst uninstantiated properties. And David uh, thinks that uh, this is clearly unsatisfactory, uh, mainly for two reasons. These reasons are connected on the, on the, on the, on the first go. He says that uh, representational facts are abstract, are non-local. And that's a, a big problem if we want to make sense of the uh, causal efficacy of uh, all kinds of experiences, including hallucinatory experiences. So in David's case, in his own uh, intrinsic uh, physical qualitative view, he, he can appeal to um, internal, intrinsic physical properties of the states involved in hallucination in order to explain, for example, the behavior or the beliefs that I might form while hallucinating. But if we are representationalists, David says, uh, we have to appeal to these abstract uninstantiated properties. 
So part of my, my comment first is to, to, to ask David to say a bit more about the, what, what's wrong with the ontology of these uh, uninstantiated properties conceived as abstract, abstract entities. That's the first part. And um, whether that leave us in any case with a sort of epiphenomenalist account for all representational properties. So that's, that's, that's the first part of the, of the question. And the second part of the question is um, connected certainly with the idea that perhaps not all representationalists uh, are happy with this uh, sort of abstract characterization. So when I was reading David's book, I went back to, to the, some of the classics I've got in my hand right now, uh, Naturalizing the Mind by Fred Dretzky, and I, and I went to, to, to uh, his chapter five on externalism and supervenience. And he's quite explicit, for example, uh, I'm gonna quote uh, Dretzky. He says, in explaining a system's behavior, we are often looking no, not inside for the physical cause or the external change. That is the business of chemistry or neurobiology, but outside for the events and circumstances that shaped internal structures that made causes, uh, cause, for example, some behavior. We are looking for right, what else were called structuring and not triggering causes of behavior. So that's an example of a, a traditional uh, representational account that is a prima facie fully in touch with this idea of a naturalist a theory of representation uh, in which content is considered uh, as deeply deeply connected with truth conditions and in this case with the history of the system. So the second part of the question is uh, why uh, a different account of representation like a traditional truth tracking theory of representation cannot appeal to concrete local facts or perhaps not concrete local facts here and now but to the history of what is going on in the brain right now uh, and make sense of the causal efficacy of, for example, hallucinatory states without appealing to this uh, unsatisfactory theory of uninstantiated properties. So that's, these are two issues which are deeply connected. So that's, the, that's, that's one of the comments I, I wanted to make. And the second is a very brief one, very short one. Um, is connected with uh, David's characterization of naive realism. Um, I take it that he is considering basically uh, MGF Martin's, for example, account of naive realism, which is a radical view, is a, is a sort of anti-representationalist view anyway. Uh, and he characterizes uh, naive realism, David, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, including both uh, the metaphysical, metaphysical commitments of uh, naive realists, the so-called fundamental distinction between uh, good and bad cases at the ontological level, and also the epistemological uh, distinction, the sort of uh, factive uh, view that characterizes successful perceptions. And when I was reading that, I say, okay, maybe this is a good characterization of naive realism, and there is something unsatisfactory in naive realism, but I started to think about uh, other kinds of relational theorists. Uh, for example, I can think about a mixed theory that includes both relational and representational facts, such as uh, Susanna Schellenberg's, for example, account um, of experience and others. So my question for David is, I can see that you are somehow worried about the fact that according to most um, relationalisms, there are some differences between the good and bad cases which are not introspectable available. I mean, we cannot make sense of those differences from the subject's point of view. And that's that's clearly a worry for David. That's something very weird or something very hard to accept. But there might be other theories in which uh, there is a relational structure which are not really committed uh, to that, and I can see in a footnote, in footnote number 11, I think it's chapter one, 
um, David says that if uh, there is no consequences for the conscious character of experience, he's not really against the idea of relational properties being involved in uh, successful perceptions, for example, apart from representational ones, if that is possible. MGF Martin, he thinks that's not possible, even the so-called explanatory screen off argument and all that, but we don't, we don't have to buy that theory according to my, my point of view. So my second question is, uh, would you agree that there are sort of uh, different variants of uh, relational theories that uh, are somehow immune to your charge, uh, or at least to that charge, that uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, sort of differences that are not introspectively available, uh, which might be fundamental, fundamental in terms of the metaphysical structure, but not really in terms of the sensory qualities of the experience. So that's, those are my, my two comments, and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, uh, David, you, you have the word, but you are muted, I suppose. Oh, am I oh, unmuted now? Can you hear me? You are unmuted, yes. Good. Let me, let me do Francisco in the reverse order, because uh, the first set of questions was messier and uh, uh, better to get the second issue out of the way mm -hmm. first. So... It wasn't clear what kind of hybrid view you had in mind. So I'm not very familiar with Susanna Schellenberg's view, but there's the, the kind of view that I take Mark Johnson to have, and I think Alex Byrne and Heather Lowe kind of air in some of their writings on disjunctivism, which is that uh, there is a common factor forced on you by what's intrinsically common to the bad and good cases. And then in the good cases, there's an extra conscious factor. And I don't really say much in the book about that, except it seems to me it violates uh, something that I find it hard to give up, which is that it's required of a conscious difference that it sometimes at least be introspectively available to the subject and positing conscious differences that are never introspectively available to the subject seems to me to to somehow empty the notion of consciousness of much content now you were saying but but what about a view that's not so fussed about consciousness but is just terribly keen on the fact that what's going on in the good case is significantly what's from what's going on significantly different from what's going on in the the worst cases i have absolutely no objection to that view at all uh, i'm very keen on the idea that uh the fact of states are important in explaining all kinds of things that don't get explained by the non-fact of states I'm rather keen on the idea that, that biologically speaking, the fact of states are the real thing, that, that perception and knowledge is where you're, that's how you're designed to work, and uh, the uh, uh, beliefs or fallacious uh, uh, sensory experiences are botched cases, and perhaps our concept of the, the weak cases is, is derivative from our concept of the good cases. I'm very happy to get behind all that. Uh, okay. It's just the view that, that somehow this makes for uh, a conscious difference that I am, am uh, uneasy about. So, so absolutely. So that, that, that was the second set of questions. Yeah. First set of questions was pushing me on the idea that, that abstract relations to uninstantiated properties and representational properties more generally are not are not suitable candidates for being conscious experiential properties because the conscious experiential properties are here and now causally involved in the way that the other ones are. Uh, okay, in the book, I, I go into a bit more detail. And I say, look, the kinds of things that enter into causal relations are concrete facts, which are typically when some physical object has the kind of first order property that physical objects have, like uh, uh, 
uh, shape and color and size and so on. Those are concrete facts. Now, I think that there are properties, and I think that they can be conceived of, we can think about them in abstraction from any of their instances, and I think that we can be related to such uh, abstract properties. I think that, uh, that when I represent a ball to be yellow, I am precisely in an abstract relation to the property of yellowness. But I don't think that that fact, the fact that I'm in that relation to the property of yellowness per se, is the kind of concrete fact that can enter into causal mm -hmm. relations. So it's, it's an analysis of what can't, what's the structure of uh, the properties we have when we represent something to be thus and so. It turns out that they involve uh, non-instantiation relations to to properties considered in themselves. And I don't think that kind of fact, the fact that consists of my having a non-instantiation relation to a worldly property can enter into causal relations. You then said, but doesn't this mean that representational properties are not themselves causally efficacious? And I say, yes, indeed. And I mean, it's not original to me. I mean, people have often worried about the, the, the cause the significance of representational properties. And I draw on, I guess, uh, the view that comes from Pettit and Jackson. I don't I suspect, I don't even mention it in the book, but 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 their thought is that uh, uh, to say that I'm representing something programs for various causal uh, relations that might obtain, and in particular would obtain in the good case. So when I'm, uh, representing something to be a yellow ball that says well in the case where there is a yellow ball in front of you then uh, uh, that will cause you to behave in a way that will be successful given your aims but i'm uh, or you might take the photo style view that will cause you to have the experience i mean but but somehow uh talking about representation programs for uh uh causal relations that don't themselves involve the representation of properties, they involve concrete facts. So that's that's why you talk about indirect causal significance of representation. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I hadn't really thought about Dretzky. I mean, Dretzky has his own particular, peculiar answer to the problem of the causal significance of representational properties. And... Uh, he doesn't specially turn to what they imply about causal goings on in the good cases. He rather turns to the, the history in which we were set up so as to respond to certain external circumstances with certain uh, internal states and certain subsequent behavior. What makes it the case that we're structured to behave in that way? So I'm not sure whether the things I say in the book would directly uh, challenge his particular view, but even so, I mean, it's slightly surprising to me now you draw attention to it, that Dretzky would have been happy to say, my having a representational property is nothing to do with the chemistry of what's going on in my brain now, it's to do with the history of how I happen to be set up in the way I now am. How he could say that about representational properties and simultaneously say that my conscious sensory properties are representational properties. That looks slightly bonkers. Uh, I mean, that's the view that what makes it the case that I feel as I do now when I have a sensory experience of a yellow ball uh, essentially consists of facts about the history of my being set up uh, to work sensorily in the way I do. And that looks very odd that the, the here and now feeling mm -hmm is is uh metaphysically constituted by a certain kind of history so it would be a slightly different objection but the objection in the same in the same spirit so okay that's me to francisco okay thank, thank you david, david. Uh, michelle has a follow-up question the word is yours michelle thanks the, i just wondered quite often um about this isn't in your book, and so I don't know if this is an unfair question, so don't answer if you don't want to. No, be, but unfair, be unfair. Do you think conscious thought is 
causally efficacious? And if so, in virtue of what? I think I think I'll think just the same about conscious thought. So so I've got a standard two factor view that when we attribute thoughts or experiences, we're simultaneously attributing an intrinsic vehicle state, and that will lead to various kinds of internal goings on and maybe to behavior. And we're ascribing a representational content to that state. And I'll just do it for my favored view. That tells us that not only will you perform certain behavior, but that in the case where the truth condition obtains, you will achieve further success. And all that will go just for conscious thoughts as much as conscious sensory experiences. But the conscious sensory experiences have the qualitative properties that are, you know, sort of the here and now that make them particularly oh. apt for causation. Right. Is there a, an, an analog in the case of conscious thought? Uh, are there, you know, what, sort of so what, what, phenomenological properties? I'm, I'm neutral on whether uh, occurrence thoughts have a phenomenology. If they do have a phenomenology, I will say what I just did and treat them entirely analogous to sensory experiences. If they don't have a phenomenology, well, that's just to say that they're vehicles that will do the internal causal explaining just the same, but they don't have a phenomenology. I mean, I, I, I don't mind either way. Uh, I, but I still think that what, hang on. if they don't have a phenomenology, it's not clear in what sense they're conscious. So, uh, yeah, so, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say conscious thoughts have a phenomenology. Yeah. Uh, how much phenomenology they have is, 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 is a further thing. And you might need them to have a lot more phenomenology than I'm prepared to, to credit. But that's, that's a, further, a further issue. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let me pass to, to Kathy. Uh, please, uh, thank you very much again for, for being here. It is a pleasure to have you. Uh, you, can, you can ask your questions now. You may. You're okay. Okay. Um, so um, I, I really love this book. Um, I'm really, really proud of being one of the uh, people to whom this uh, book is dedicated. <laughs> I'd like to one put that in. Um, um, I, uh, I, I agree with a lot of things um, that uh, David says, and I'm going to uh, say in a moment uh, some of the things that, uh, on which I agree with him. Um, but I also have some differences of opinion. Um, so my my text for today from David, I'm just going to read out this this quote. Um, it was on page 75. Uh, David here is talking about the kind of phenomenal intentionalists who think that um, phenomenal properties, uh, sensory properties, are intrinsically representational, and uh, they largely think that uh, they represent properties uh, many of them that properties of uh, my independent objects. And um, people like Brian Law or uh, Anjana Mandelovici or David Bourget or Uriah Krigo. Mm, so there it says, their position is that sensory experience is intrinsically directed, pointing out to a world beyond itself, even if this directedness fails to fix any definite truth conditions without the assistance of the subject's environment. This is a viable position, but the obvious question is what distinguishes it from the kind of purely qualitative view that I am defending. Once it is granted that conscious character fails to fix truth conditions on its own, the claim that it is essentially representational is called into question. After all, my own view also takes conscious sensory character to determine truth conditions once it is given an environmental setting. Yet on my view, conscious sensory character in itself is representationally dumb. I do not dispute that sensory experience has a rich and distinctive introspectable structure, nor do I dispute that this structure makes it extremely natural to think of sensory experience as intrinsically pointing to a world beyond. But from my point of view, this intrinsic, intrinsic directedness is a kind of illusion. The sensory experiences do in fact represent features of the world beyond. This is an entirely contingent matter deriving from the way they are environmentally embedded. Experiences themselves are no more intrinsically direct beyond themselves than are the marks and sounds that make up the words in a human language. So um, 
the people that, uh, that David criticizing here, um, they often think of uh, a case of sort of intrinsic representationalness or intrinsic directedness is that you could have a just a, a sensory experience as of something being read. And then you take the redness in your experience and that redness represents the worldly property of physical red or something like that. So in, in any way, a property that, that, that objects have. So I, um, and, and, and David thinks this is, uh, this is unmotivated or no, no so David thinks that this is problematic for, for various reasons. I myself think that this is unmotivated. Um, so I totally agree with David that if we just focus on a single quality of redness in an experience and we look at it, whether it points to or, or whether it actually represents a, a worldly property, then um, then uh, the answer should be no or maybe, but it's, uh, uh, they, the view that um, um, these fundamental intentionalists have that it definitely represents something is, is problematic. So I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think um, uh, I, my view is my view differs from those people because um, I think that intentionality and representation of experience, transcendent things, starts really with objects, bearers of properties rather than properties. So I think that our idea of the uh, world beyond experience is formed once we. Once you can have things that that have properties that seem to uh, to exist independently of experience, and have those properties independently of our experiences. So I suggest, and David describes this in the book, that once you have once the experience has a certain structure, and these qualities like red and uh, shape and uh, smell of gasoline and all those things, um, they come together in an organized structure and sort of get fixed around certain nodes in the structure of properties, then we form an idea of objects having those properties, and that's the origin of intentionality. But David thinks that um, <clears throat> even though experience does have this structure, and that makes it very tempting to think that you know it represents the world, that's an illusion. Um, uh, it's th they, that apparent pointed, pointedness of uh, of, uh, of the uh, of sensory experience is an illusion. The real representation comes from uh, causal embeddedness. And um, once you realize that this is an illusion, then you realize that is, then he uses this um, analogy a lot in the book, and he also mentioned it uh, in his summary, that uh, the sensory qualities are no more representational than words. So I have an issue with that, and I would like to make two points um, here. Um, one is that um, um, sensory qualities that are involved in perceptual experiences have an internal quality space. So um, color properties um, have certain dimensions of difference and similarity uh, that orders them into a um, certain dimensional four-dimensional, three-dimensional space according to hue, brightness, and, uh, and saturation. Um, order properties, or smell properties, have a very different structure. Um, they don't have this um, variation according to these three dimensions. Auditory properties are, again, have a very different structure. Um, they have similarities, they have intrinsic similarities and differences are, um, are very different. And um, and this is significant uh, because you will find that those properties, worldly properties that are represented by these, uh, these qualities have a very similar structure. So the surface properties of uh, objects that uh, give rise to our color experiences have an isomorphic structure. Um, and the order properties, um, uh, so the properties of chemicals that cause our order experiences have an isomorphic or a homomorphic structure. And the same with sounds. So um, it would be um, actually quite different to do, for example, a smell vision inversion, uh, because it would be quite difficult to arrange the physical causes of um, smell experiences or olfactory experiences to produce something like the quality space of the uh, 
of the visual, um, uh, the, uh, the sorry, uh, color properties. So some intrinsic properties, intrinsic sense, uh, conscious properties are tailor-made to represent some uh, cluster of properties in the world. There is, there is a natural affinity between the intrinsic structure of the experience um, and, um, and, and the, the, uh, the, the cluster of properties that are represented by this. So that's my first point, and that is very different <coughs> from the way um, sounds or marks on the paper represent words, because there is absolutely nothing in the sound apple or in the, um, in the sign A uh, and PPL that would make it suitable to represent apples rather than pears. There isn't a natural affinity between the vehicle and, uh, and what gets represented, and that's very different. I claim for sensory structure. So that's the first point I'm going to make. Um, and then maybe maybe David will say, okay, you know, an analogy only goes as far as it goes, and no analogy is perfect. So this is an imperfect part of the analogy. Um, yes, maybe there is more affinity, and maybe um, David could say um, it's a bit like uh, functionalism or functional role. So you know. Um, Objects don't essentially have functional roles because it depends, uh, at least you know, for, you know that they're used as as, uh, as, as, uh, as certain tools or objects for us because it depends on, on on what we use them for. So I could use this thing for as a coffee cup, but also as a ashtray, or um, um, you know, I could use it for all sorts of purposes. And and uh, but of course there is. There is a certain affinity between the intrinsic properties of the object and the function that we put to. So this this would be a better coffee cup and ashtray than than this thing that, that I also have here on the uh, on the table. Um, but si still, that's no more intrinsically uh, an ashtray um, than 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 this is. It depends on how we use it. So I think this is. Um, I mean, maybe uh, maybe that's uh, maybe maybe that analogy would uh, would work well. But um, here I would like to make a a second point, and and I don't I don't know whether that I will ever, I don't think I will ever convince David of this. <laughs> I'd just like to 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 um, to see how uh, to to say how I um, I see this. So I think as long as the um, the experience has the inner point in us. The appearance of an external world, um, and then you add something like the context um, that it's embedded into, and there is something in the world that that it does indeed have that homomorphic structure that corresponds to the internal quality space of the uh, of the experiences. Um, then, then you have representation. So that those things. Um, are already sufficient to make representation. So the whole thing will be a mixture of intrinsic directedness under all of the embedding uh, that lands a certain cluster of properties um, at the uh, uh, at the uh, at the receiving end. Okay, that was my comment. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> David, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, this is terrible. It's terrible. I don't think we we disagree at all until we get to the final sentence where, uh, and it's intrinsically representational, where I want to say no and you want to say yes. So I, I mean, everything you said was very interesting, and uh, it's Jermaine and I agree with what you say. So I guess the issue just be is becoming very fine fine tune but let me just go through the things you you said i mean just to bring out a different way of looking at it uh maybe we're not going to disagree again uh you wanted to focus on objects not properties i'm happy about that i mean in in your paper constructing a world for the senses i i mean i seem to remember you don't focus on objects very much in that and in the book i say there's something Cotty doesn't make a song and dance about, but I would like to make a bit more of a song and dance about, which is that within uh, the world, within sensory experience, there are object-like things, nodes onto which we plant, 
properties. I agree. But of course, you'll agree that uh, these aren't yet worldly objects. Uh, we can have an object like thing like that in a case where we're having a continuing hallucination. So, so I don't see that bringing in the objects as well as the properties is really bringing one any closer to intrinsic representationalism about experience. Uh, the thing about the structure of the quality spaces, uh, I agree about that. I agree about something that you've been working on recently and which I don't talk about in the book and you didn't talk about in your comments that, that uh, uh, this kind of structure in certain kinds of experiences, especially spatial experiences, links up with, with inclinations to behavior in a certain way and that arguably is what makes uh, visual sensory experience kind of three-dimensional and uh, uh, world representing and not just flat and two-dimensional. I'm kind of happy with that, that thought, that thought too. But the fact that these internal experiential spaces have a certain structure and renders them useful for representing some things and not others, I still want to say doesn't make them intrinsically representational. You say the, the analogy with words breaks down here. It's not so obvious it does. I mean, there are words that have a, a kind of uh, uh, internal structure that renders them suitable for representing certain things and not for representing other things. Numerals, for instance. I mean, uh, take, take the numerals in English. I mean, uh, it's not an accident they have the kind of recursive structure they do. That makes them very good for representing numbers. Uh, not obvious what else they'd be good for representing. Uh, but still, they're just words uh, uh, intrinsically done. Uh, the, the line that some internal thing with a certain... Uh, certain structure, certain internal relations, uh, represents anything in the world that has the same structure. I mean, that's an idea that's been around and isn't very plausible. That's, that's Robert Cummins' idea of representation in cognitive science. I mean, he's, he's considering computers. Here's a computer. It's running some program, a lot of switches. Uh, what's it representing? He says, in itself, it represents anything with the same structure. You might use that computer to represent the payroll in the king's uh, 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 employees, but you could equally well use that same structure to represent traffic flow in Santiago, and so it indiscriminately represents in itself all those things. And that doesn't seem to me a very plausible account of representation. I mean, it makes representation far too promiscuous. And the natural thing is to say, no, no, it represents uh, those features of the world that it's related to via its cause and embedding in the world. Uh, so, yeah, so, so at this point, where's our difference? Look, there's this paper by Brandon Ashby who says, look, uh, attending to this kind of internal structure. Look, sensory experiences have a syntax, is what he calls it, that, that makes them uh, appropriate for representing the things that they actually represent and would prevent them from representing other things. So he, he grants that the syntax itself doesn't determine what they represent, but he still thinks that the syntax in its own means that they're kind of essentially symbolic even before they get truth conditions virtue, virtue of their environmental embedding. And I just don't see any virtue in thinking of things as symbolic representations in abstraction from the way they actually get to be representations in virtue of environmental embedding. So, yeah, I mean, Cody, we agree too much. Uh, yeah. I, I've got nothing more to say. Uh,
Yeah, but I think I think the uh, um, I, I think you really you just really are the words the analogy with words I think is so misleading, um, because um, because um, I mean you when when you one, one no. of the things that, that you say is that it's like you know um, it's like yellow and blue so a lot of people appeal to inversion, and of course if you focus on the inversion cases the color inversion cases. Then mm -hmm. it looks like it's really, really entirely contingent whether this color qualia okay. represents that surface. But most of the properties are not like that at all. But so, well, let's let but let's switch the languages. Take take the the marks or sounds I use to do differential calculus. Uh, uh, no, clearly you aren't going to get inversions with that i mean i can't just invert the first derivative and second derivative and get everything to work the same but still uh the the fact that i mean it's not intrinsic to all those symbols that we use that they represent the numerical relations that they do represent it's uh yeah, so if you're if you're if you're analogy, so we, we we can switch the analogy. I mean, just, I mean, just do it with numerals. But I mean, but think about all, all all the cases of mathematical representation where the symbols have a structure that's required for them to adequately represent the structure of reality that they do represent. Yeah, so that's a better analogy. It's a much better analogy than that. Okay, well, I, I so we we start off with color experiences and uh, and uh, when we switch to shape experiences, which I do at the end of chapter three. I do bring in the, the, the mathematical symbols analogy. Uh, so. Fair enough. Yeah. Thank you very much. I will uh, continue by um, passing the word to, to Michel Montague. Thank you very much again for accepting our invitation. The word is yours. Thanks. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, yeah, the book was great, David. It, it really made me um, think a lot about a lot of different issues, and it's very rich. I have loads of questions, so it's hard for me to focus on one. But I just wanted to um, pick up on this idea that sensory properties are somehow contingently representational. And I, I, I want to say it in two parts. F the first part I want to say, if you... So take a, a, an experience, a phenomenological experience of redness, um, to go back to the simple example. And that, you know, keep that, that phenomenological redness fixed and vary the physical environments like, you know, for example, um, Ned Block's inverted earth. Now, I think that even though um, the, the causal environment changes, there is something that remains the same with respect to subject, and that is the attribution of the phenomenological redness spread out across an object. So even though you might want to say, oh, now you're causally interacting with something different on inverted earth, there's something that remains the same between me and inverted earth, and that's the attribution of phenomenological redness, and that attribution is made in virtue of having that phenomenology, even if you want to call what you're, you know, sort of now seeing yellow um, because it's sort of this the, a different causal environment. So that's just to, to, to say that there's, to, to give a plug to there, you know, there's a necessary attribution of something that follows the phenomenology no matter what you do to the environment. Um, so that's just a plug for that. Uh, and that made me think about your idea of, about sensory properties contingently representing um, what that amounted to, because I started becoming confused about what, what it could mean to take this simple, these simple sensory properties and say that they could represent so many different things. Um, so if you have any sensory profile and it exists, it's going to be part of a causal network because it exists, let's, you know, I, I think you would agree to that. And so as soon as it's in a causal network and it's hooked up to a causal network in a regular way, it's going to represent however it's, you know, sort of hooked up. And so actually 
it might be more accurate to say no sensory properties are essentially representational because as soon as they exist in any kinds of causal network, they're going to start representing in virtue of being hooked up into that causal network. It's just what they represent might change. Um, so that made me think about the cosmic brain. So the cosmic brain, you say, is somewhere in the universe. Uh, presumably, it, once it exists in the universe, it's going to be causally hooked up to that universe in some way. And so it's going to represent by your own lights. So it's just, I, I just lost my sense. And I have this sense in which it could be what it represents might change, but that it's representational doesn't change. Um, so then you say, so that's my first thought about the cosmic brain. And then you say, um, no, the cosmic brain is not representational because it hasn't, it's not hooked up like um, I'm hooked up despite its phenomenological, being a phenomenological duplicate. But as you say, somebody might say, well, it, it is, you know, counterfactually hooked up quite nicely. So once you plop it down, um, and if it's just like me, it's going to have those causal uh, connections right off. Um, and so uh, you say, oh, but counterfactuals are cheap. Um, a snail could uh, represent if you change the counterfactuals enough. But the counterfactuals in the cosmic brain are, are easy and straightforward. There's not a lot of changing you have to do to get those counterfactuals to come out true. But for the snail to be representational in some way, presumably you'd have to change your way change the counterfactuals around quite a bit. So um, I was a little bit worried about that response. And then my final, so I'm, I'm really interested in, in the sort of, you know, what counts as a representation? What does it mean to be, a, you know, contingently representing? Um, and so my final thought about all, all of these kind of thought experiments was the matrix example. So you say that in the matrix, Neo and his, pod people, I can't really remember the movie that well, are representing states of the computer. And then I thought, well, why do they want to leave? You know, they're sort of having accurate representations. So, I mean, why are they so keen to get out of the matrix? Anyway, so you can see how my questions are all revolving around uh, this idea of contingent representation or that sensory properties contingently represent. So that's, that's it. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, very interesting questions, raising a number of, of issues. Let's do the first one. Uh, I mean, that's, you're pointing there to a line of argument, which where, I mean, I've, I've heard you suggest going that way in a talk. Uh, Uriah Kriegel quite often goes that way, which is that, we've got to make the properties that we're representing in experience response dependent properties. And then it's easier for uh, sensory experiences to represent intrinsically and not get tied up with broad contents and so on. So, so in the inverted earth case, the thought would be that here I am, I'm, you know, I'm on normal earth and I'm seeing the sky and it's blue and then I'm shunted off to twin earth and I'm fiddled with and so on and the sky's actually yellow but I still feel it's blue the same, right? And so now you can't read off from the phenomenology what it's representing. And your thought is not too fast because perhaps you should could think of the kind of property that color experiences represent as the property in objects of being disposed to produce a certain uh, uh, sensory response. And now the sky on Earth and the sky on uh, Twin Earth both are disposed to produce a certain sensory response in me at least. And to that extent, I'm accurately representing them to be the kinds of things that are going to produce the sensory response. So, and uh, okay, so that... That line 
involves two moves. First of all, you've got to have the properties represented by sensory experiences being response dependent. And then you've got to make it plausible that sensory experiences represent such funny properties. And that seems to me a lot of work. And it's not clear, it's not clear why one's going in for it when one's got a perfectly reasonable alternative, uh, the view I have, where you just represent ordinary categorical properties in the world. Now, I mean, in the case of colors, it's uh, not a bad line to run because colors are very funny properties, but it looks pretty horrible in the case of shapes and sizes. Uh, so, but hang on, let, 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 let's, let me just put on the table, there's two issues here. I mean, I mean, independently of all the things we're talking about, some people think the right to count of colors is to think of them as dispositions to produce certain sensory responses. Uh -huh. uh, scarcely anybody thinks that the right to count of shapes is to think of shape properties as dispositions to produce certain uh, sensory responses in people. And I would, I mean, we, we can start going into details if we like, but I can think of a couple of arguments against that, that position now. So that's already a problem. And then apart from that, even if we stick with the colors, there's a challenge to say, look, what I'm representing is the fact that this object is disposed to produce certain sensory responses in people. Why would I bother to represent that? Think of all those animals. What, I mean, they're not interested in representing that a certain object is going to cause certain responses in other animals. I mean, why would, I mean, they want to represent the certain thing, this, this thing is good to eat or is part of a tiger or something. Uh, so anyway, uh, there we are. That was that was the first issue. Uh, a, you've got to make good the properties represented are response dependent properties, and B, you've got to make good that uh, uh, we're actually representing them. Uh, uh, so that's the worry about about that. And and it seems to me that you know, somebody who is convinced of uh, essential representationalism will have to go down that route. But it looks to me like it's the the theoretical tail wagging the dog. I mean, why would you want to go down that route unless you were trying to defend this, this particular view of sensory experience? Uh, nobody wants to... Um, I, I was... I was just saying that I was... Because I think this is a whole big issue. I'm starting to get the sense that People in the representationist camp are are interested in exploring this kind of view, and I give it pretty short. I, mean, I, I discuss in the book, but I, I only to put it one side pretty quickly. I, I'll just say that I'm not necessarily advocating this response dependent view. Actually, right. What I'm trying to do is to sh to sort of argue that there's something there's a, a similar color attribution or there's a similar property attribution being made in any experience that has phenomenological redness as part of it. So that phenomenological redness is being attributed to something in virtue of being what it is. And that is going to be true no matter what the environment, because you're attributing the color property in virtue of having that phenomenology. But, so that's a slightly different from... Um, well, say a bit more. I mean, I'm taking it that you think that there's some built-in connection between the phenomenal property, the property I have when I have an experience of something red, and the property being attributed to objects yeah there's some, there's some built in connection uh, now i mean yeah. the representation is that i jump on to start with ty and Dretsky and anybody else who trains in transparency say it's the same property but i take it you don't no. think that. you don't think the property i have is the same property as a now so the question is what is the built in connection now one built in connection would would be forged by going dispositional about the property and the object. But I, so I'm, it's not clear to me what other built-in connection you might have in mind. It's just 
I mean, I don't know. I'm going to repeat. I mean, we can leave this to the side too. It's, I'm going to repeat myself. It's, it's in both my case on earth and say on inverted earth, a, you know, you sort of experiencing some property is being spread out the, over the surface of the object. Right. So, and I'm saying in both of those cases, the, 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 the way it phenomenologically seems to you, what it, which property it phenomenologically seems to you to be spread out over the surface of the object is the same. What may vary is the um, surface reflectance properties. And I totally agree with you about that. And I totally agree with your criticisms of Ty and Dretzky and their view about the relationship between the surface properties and our phenomenology. Yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I mean, I, I understand, but I'm still, I'd still press you on say more about this property that we're representing yeah. spread out yeah. on the surface and tell me what it's got to do with my phenomenal property. That, that's, a, that's a gap still. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I'd have to say a lot more and okay. I try to, I try to. So we'll just leave that one. Um, let, me, let me quickly go to your... Okay. Uh, other thoughts, just the thing about the matrix, uh, it's not clear they want to leave. I mean, uh, Neo has some funny experiences and he realized something's odds going on, but most of them are, 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 are happy bunnies. And indeed, if you remember the film, some of the people who get out the matrix into the real world find it so horrible that they want to go back into the matrix. Uh, so there's nothing terribly wrong with the matrix from the point of view of the pe people in it. Uh, um, I don't have anything more to say, I think, much about this idea that something's representational, essentially, because if it got stuck into an environment, it would represent. Uh, uh, that seems to me a terribly weak notion of representation. After all, Sensory experiences, on my view, are representational in that sense. So, I mean, I think that sensory experiences are such that when we're stuck into an environment, they represent what they represent. Uh, but, then, but then you should think the cosmic brain represents, because uh, it's obviously in an environment. You know, it's well, I, I, I have the cosmic brain. It's proceeding as it does. Uh, Maybe the story is underdescribed. I mean, maybe I have to have quantum uh, freaks going along all the time, but but it's not responding to an environment. It just so happens to duplicate uh, the the physical processes going on in my brain for twenty minutes, not because of the way it's being prompted by an environment. So there's no systematic connections between what's going on inside it and the environment. So it's not yet. Uh, it, it's it, the, the only thought as I'm setting it up, is that if you took that brain and stuck it inside me, inside uh, Kentish Town, then it would represent just fine. But uh, oh. uh, it's, 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 it's not appropriately correlated to the environment just in outer space. Uh, now you press me, and maybe I should have, you might wonder, how does it get to duplicate my brain for 20 minutes? Uh, and... Uh, I remember reading some stuff by Dennett saying it's much, much harder than you think, but I'm still not. I mean, it's, it's only it's only a thought experiment designed to to uh, sharpen some philosophical issues. And I'm not sure that for that purpose, I can't just posit, posit the sequence of events. Well, I mean, Ty is going to deny that. The, uh, he's going to say, you know, the cosmic brain can't have the same phenomenology as no, no, quite quite so, yeah, so, so it's, we, it's, we, we've got that non-standard move available there and yeah. Uh, uh yeah so i was i was i was assuming that everybody everybody here agreed that it would have have the same phenomenology but uh you can go you can go hard line i mean they so say he's he's so attached to the same theory of representation as i have and so he, he thinks it's not representing and then he bites the bullet and says, well, so it's not conscious either. Um, right. Yeah. Francisco has a follow-up. 
Um, yes, David, I, I got a bit confused, or, or perhaps I, I just want to hear more from you when you were talking about the how uh, redness star, phenomenal redness, yeah. is different from squareness star or phenomenal squareness. Because uh, let's leave the representational issue on, on the side and, and focus on the on, on on the tricky topic of the ontology of colors <laughs> um, because I mean uh, I remember that w when you were arguing against naive realism uh, you you mentioned uh, how Adam Potts uh, um, says that the, the uh, phenomenal similarities that we can find at the level of phenomenal uh, experiences between a yellowness star or redness star uh, has nothing to do with the similarities that we can observe in the sort of mind independent world in terms of uh, <laughs> reflectances profiles. Yeah. So I take it that for you, phenomenal redness or redness star should be identical to our intrinsic physical property of the brain. Uh, neural pattern or something like that. So it seems to me that you must be committed to a, a wholly mentalist or physicalist quant mentalist theory of colors and any other account of color or properties like colors, including, I don't know, uh, uh, colors conceived as uh, relational properties or dispositional properties or, or even uh, ecological properties. I'm, I'm thinking about the activists and Shirimuta and other uh, Mm -hmm. philosophers so my question would be what do you think about colors because colors are so important sometimes you can infer from a theory of colors the theory of perception <laughs> on, on a general basis and the other way around so what are colors for you and how they differ phenomenally speaking if we can actually distinguish between phenomenal red and redness as such uh, how they differ from 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 squareness star or phenomenal squareness. So I'm, I'm not quite sure that I mean I, to be honest, I've never really put my mind to choosing between different theories of colors as properties of objects. I've mentioned a kind of Lockean. Uh, view that it's the property and objects have been disposed to produce certain responses in observers. I think I'm more attracted to a straightforward reductionist view that they refer to reflectance profiles, something like, like that. But uh, then it turns out that they aren't really Okay, so, so, so you have reason in the world to, to fit that. No, I, I have no strong views about the ontology of colors per se, but I'm just wondering what you were pressing me on. So there's, there's the red star properties, the properties of me that I have when I'm prompted by a red object out there. And on any account, those properties aren't going to be the same as properties that objects have. Uh, there's on different views, different things to say about the connection between them. But uh, yes, yeah. so I was I, I wasn't quite sure what, what you were. Yeah, no. Uh, okay, so about. so two things. So I take it that you can be a reductionist about colors and you identify colors with uh, reflection profiles reductively, and then we have phenomenal red, and phenomenal red represents contingently reflectances profiles over there somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And so, is there any distinction then between, I mean, phenomenal red as such uh, being uh, simply a sensory quality intrinsic to your brain mm -hmm. and a squareness, a star? Uh, I, I want to say they're both on the same ontological grounds. Well, I want to say. At first pass, I want to say the same about them, but then there's the point that Cotty was stressing that the shape yeah, experience. Yeah, I was thinking a about lot, that. A lot more structure than color experiences, which limits what they can usefully be used to to represent. Uh, and there's 
the point I made in response to Michelle, and I'm just now suddenly worrying does it have any, anything to do with the point that uh, Katya and I are discussing, which is that uh, shape properties in the objects, it's not plausible to give a dispositional account of them uh, in the way it is for color properties. So th 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 those are two, two disanalogies. But uh, at first pass, I want to say the same thing about uh, uh, the relation between star properties, both color and and uh, yeah. shape, and the the non-star properties. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Well, uh, Koti has a follow-up question. Yes. Um, so I'm I'm very exercised about what one would, should say about brains in beds. Um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I see that the the one who is just uh, existing for twenty minutes is a mm -hmm. different case. But I mean, matrix and things like that. And I remember yeah. that once we talked about this. And I am deeply bothered by the consequence of a view that brains in beds see the bits of the computer program rather than um, being victims of a, a, a big deception. And you're yeah. not worried that, about that at all. Um, that just, I, I never managed to sort out the following question. Um, yeah. What's the difference between saying that uh, you have a brain in a vat which is massively deceived about the world um, because what, you know, what's around it is completely different from what it thinks? That question. And the other question is the manifest image and the scientific image of the world. Because, I mean, on some views, we are anyway massively deceived about the world on anyone's account who agrees with physics, because, mm -hmm. you know, things are tiny particles that have space between them, um, and they don't have colors and odors and things like that. And yet the world seems to be, you know, colorful and odorful and solid, and things don't have gaps in them. Um, so... Um, but, but I, I find that somehow the idea that just because what we perceive, the manifest image of the world, mm. is different from the scientific image of the world, that means that we are massively deceived somehow. And I think that gives rise to ideas like certain motivations for dualism, that, you know, that colors must be in the mind because they can't be in the world and we're just massively deceived that colors are in the world. And I really don't like that. I think our colors are perfectly good properties in the world. Um, it doesn't matter that they don't figure in physical theories. So do you have anything illuminating to say on this topic? Not, not really. I mean, there's a mess, mess of difficult issues here, and I don't have any clearly worked out thoughts about it. I mean, take take uh, the inverted people in the matrix. So there's the standard line, I guess, starts with, with Putnam, that look, they're just referring to... Uh, features of the computer and and they're right about everything in fact they're right about the fact that they're not brains and rats uh, because they're not brains and rats in the computer story uh, and and there's something worry about this Putnam line because you feel look surely they're deceived about something and the question is how can you give them as it were the wherewithal to think false thoughts about the situation you know, one can try and think of various ways of doing that. Uh, I guess the Putnam problem, the, the, the thing that I say is it's hard to see how you can give them give them false thoughts, is premised on they're not being able to find out anything more. I mean, once once you can have them finding out more things, then they can find out that they're deceived. Uh, I mean, as when Neo gets a whichever colored pill it is. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure that the, that the Putnam setup is a good analogy for, for the manifest and the scientific image. And well, it's, I don't my, 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 my general line in the manifest scientific image is, 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 is that the scientific image doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, falsify the manifest image. Uh, uh, I'm much more inclined to be reductionist about things than relativist. Uh, so... Yeah, well, I didn't mean the Putnam thing originally, but there is the David Chalmers line on the Matrix. I mean, this is what I think basically this is what he's saying that, you know, um, uh, the Matrix people are not wrong, but they just have a rather unusual metaphysics. Um, I, I take it that that's very similar to the point about 
um, saying that, you know, you have this manifest image and if it all turns out to be bits in the computer program, um, isn't that quite similar to saying that, you know, the colors and things and we just use the tiny particles with um, nothing in between them. So I, I haven't, I haven't read Dave's new book yet, nor listened to him on. No, that's not in your new book. That's an old paper. I, I and, don't no. and so he thinks the matrix people are wrong about something. Their metaphysics no. is wrong. They're not wrong about anything. Well, well, no, I think, I think, I think they, it is, it comes to a certain kind of surprise to them that the, the, the metaphysics of their world, just like I think it, ah. it probably comes to us quite surprised that, um, in fact, the solid objects that we have around them are tiny particles with, um, with space between them. Isn't that, isn't that quite surprising? It's not right. Surprising that and so the sort of, but, but, but we weren't denying that before we found these things out, nothing in what we were previously thinking negated this extra stuff. That seems no, to me the fine. Same, it's the same for brains and rats. That seems to me fine. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I look, I, 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 uh, uh, I don't want people to listen to what I've got to say about this because it's not something I've really thought about very long or hard. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, David, and all of you. I was thinking about, well, may, maybe we could make a short break right now and, and, and return before Sergio's and, and Roberto's questions. Would it be okay for you? Sure. I'm sorry. David, you are muted. Can I do anything about that? Oh, yeah. No, you're not. You're. We hear you. We're going to have a little bit. How long? Uh, how long would you like? Maybe you're, it could be very minute. short. It could take five minutes if you prefer. Three minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Five minutes then. Okay. So I mean, I'm making that at 45, right? 45, yeah. Okay. See uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. Okay, very, good. very good. Just testing. Good. So, should so we leave or should we just walk away? We have I, I, I think uh, Macorello could put us in backstage. I, I'm going to get you all in backstage, and when you get back, I'm going to get you in, in the room again. So uh, we're going to be back in five minutes, okay? Yes. All right. I'm going to make a copy. Okay, see you.
All right. We have a few people back. Just let's just wait for the others. So next one's going to be Sergio, right? And then no, you, Hubert. Me, me. Oh, sorry, Hubert the first, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sergio, the last one. That's true. Uh, oh, look, we have a kid. That's cool. <laughs> Hiya, hi, Mimi. Oh, how, how old is she, Kate? There should be two kids there. Yeah. No. Uh, there is a grown the up. Husband. <laughs> the husband. The husband. All right. I'm going to get Sergio back to. Rafael. Yeah. So I'm going to leave it on you, Rodrigo. Okay. Thank you, Marco Aurelio. Thanks again. Uh, so let us continue with the debate. Uh, Roberto is the ne next one to, to, to ask questions to David. Afterwards, we'll have the, the, the discussion. And then Sergio. Uh, I'll like to remind the audience that after these rounds, there will be, uh, there will be some time for questions from the audience that will be read by, by Marco Aurelio. So if you want to ask a question, just write it down in the comments of our YouTube page. Roberto, the, the word is yours. I would like to con congratulate uh, David for the book. It's quite uh, insightful, ingenious, uh, raised a lot of questions, quite interesting. Uh, but I'm going straight back to my point. David's qualitative view splits in four tenets or more. The first is, is, is the simple one. Intrinsic uh, duplicates are phenomenal duplicates. That is, conscious properties are narrowly individuated. They are, as David says, intrinsic properties of people, something that lights up inside the brain, regardless of what is going on outside the brain. Second tenet is that uh, phenomenal properties are broadly individuated. What experience represents, whether it succeeds, is up to the environment, which contains particulars and distal properties. So representational properties are relational properties of experience. The third tenet is that there is nothing in between that could bridge the gap between the narrow consciousness and the broad content, such as narrow contents, uh, content schemas, propositional functions. Indeed, what are present to conscious experience are what they call quasi-objects or quasi-properties. Finally, assuming that conscience is narrow and content is broad, conscience properties and representation properties are only contingently related. Dave's complaints against the relational views of consciousness uh, that uh, he wonders how particular and distal properties could make their way inside the conscience. He puts it sounds a little better than magic. Now I want to indicate what strikes me to be the main problem for the qualitative view. The point is, if, is indeed, if there is indeed a, an unbridgeable gap between narrow consciousness and broad contents, it's also hard to see how consciousness imprison it inside the brain could find its way into the outside world of particulars and distal properties. It sounds little better than magic. 
my uh, the the main problem splits into three uh, related ob objections. The first is ep epistemological one. If consciousness are only of quasi object or quasi properties, the question is how could sensory conscious experience provide evidence for the corresponding perceptual beliefs whose contents contain particulars and distal properties. If I can only see a quasi-ball, how could this experience entitle me, entitle me to believe that I see a ball? Dave's qualitative view threats to make consciousness epistemically idle. The second is the introspective one. Dave claims that most of the time, most of times, we know introspectively the phenomenal properties by means of perceptual beliefs that our conscious experience inclines us to form. Once again, since there is a gap between consciousness and content, to know the content of the perceptual belief of my, that my experience inclines me to have, I have to know beforehand the environment where I am embedded. Block's inverted earth exemplifies the problem. To know whether you experience the quail blueness or the quail yellowness, you have to certify yourself whether you are on earth or on inverted earth. The third problem that I see is uh, the account for intended behavior. According to David, uh, the suspect of intended behavior is up to the world, to the outside world. Fair enough. Yet, since Dave's recognize only broad content, intended behavior must be also broadly individuated. Consider a footballer contemplated a ball 10 centimeters from her. What she intends to do is to kick that ball rather than any other qualitative identical particular. But according to David Qualitative View, the ball as a particular is never present to the footballer's conscious experience. Given this, not only the intended behavior never succeed, assuming the gap, it is hard to see how consciousness could even initiate the intended behavior in the first place. Dave's qualitative views threats to make conscious, consciousness causally idle. That's my question. Thank you, Roberto, very much. Uh, David. Thank you, Roberto. Very, very interesting, very interesting and challenging questions uh let me just uh, let me just ask something about the way you set set it up the way you describe my argument you describe me as arguing from phenomenal properties are narrow and representational properties are broad and therefore they can't be the same i i'm not sure i commit myself to that i'm not sure let me, let me let me put this out i think everything in the book is consistent with the possibility that conscious properties might supervene on things outside the body uh, uh, i the, the, the causal argument that I run against representationalism is not an argument against naive realism. Uh, naive realists are fine. Conscious properties are local enough to make a causal difference. For naive realists, conscious properties are relations to concrete facts. That's the kind of relation that can make a causal difference. So the, the argument was, was rather from the abstractness about of representation, not from the 
broadness of it. I mean, that's how I think about it. Maybe I didn't make it clear in the book that I wasn't presupposing phenomenal narrowness. Uh, I'd like to to think I wasn't. I, I didn't want to beg questions against against people look, who, who deny it. Uh, Roberta, you look. Uh, if you if you if you are here and you 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 have a duplicate uh, in a vat, and yeah. you can experience exactly the same quelia, uh, and mm -hmm. here you are representing something there nothing, you must uh, you must uh, take in the, uh, the the uh, you must assume yeah, right. that, that, that the 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 conscious property are narrowly individuated. I, I do, no, I, I agree that the, the appeal to the cosmic brain and the vat uh, as, as, I, as I said to Michelle, I was presupposing uh, among present company that it would share my phenomenal properties and that does commit me to the assumption that I'm saying I wasn't using but I still think of that cosmic brain and of that as, as I said, it was a, a thought experiment designed to sharpen a metaphysical point. It wasn't being used as a premise in an argument. And I, I think in the book I avoid presupposing narrowness about phenomenal content as an argument. I mean, it, it's slightly odd because I, I mean, I do, I do believe it, uh, but uh, I don't know. I mean. Uh, how much is involved in fixing conscious properties? Is it just what's inside my cortex, or is it uh, the whole of my body, or is it uh, uh, if I'm driving a car, the rest of the car, or is it? I mean, I, I, I have no strong views about extended extended vehicles. Uh, uh, but anyway, that that wasn't your main main worry. Your main worry was uh, the difficulties that arose uh, given my qualitative view. And uh, uh, my general response to your worry is to endorse something that you said I was committed to and you regarded as a deficit in my view. I, the, on my view, consciousness is epistemically idle. Uh, but that rather is my view. So j j just take your, your first point. You, you were worried that if all we uh, are aware of in the first instance are quasi-objects and quasi-properties, how can we possibly have justified uh, uh, knowledge of things uh, beyond the mind? Uh, that's not my view at all. I don't think that uh, in epistemology we should start with knowledge of quasi-objects and quasi-properties? Absolutely not. Uh, we have perceptions that are about, uh, their representational content is about worldly objects and worldly properties. The representations don't represent sensory experience, sensory representations, they represent worldly objects and properties. And uh, sometimes these, uh, sensory experiences are well founded and uh, uh, are good grounds for forming further beliefs. And then we have beliefs about worldly objects and properties. So, so I'm not I'm not the kind of foundationist who wants to start with knowledge of our own conscious goings on and infer the rest of the world from that. I'm I'm in epistemology. I'll start with sensory experiences and or beliefs about the external world. So. Uh, and and uh, I'm inclined towards reliabilist ideas in epistemology. I mean, what makes these uh, uh, experiences and resulting beliefs uh, uh, good uh, for relying on is that they have been formed by reliable processes that generally generate truths. Uh, and the fact that they're conscious in various ways is neither neither here nor there. Uh, uh, so. That's my view about epistemology. You thought that in order to, my story about how we 
form beliefs introspectively about our experiences uh, required us to note that the experiences incline us to form beliefs with various contents and then you were worried that we uh, needed to know what environment we were in in order to know what the contents of our beliefs are. I don't think I want to accept that we need to know that. So uh, when I'm on inverted earth and I think about uh, the color of the sky, uh, my experiences and my thoughts and my words will be all about yellowness in virtue of the fact that that's the property out there that they that they track and i don't need to so not make it the case that they have those contents by knowing that i'm in that world i am in that world and as a result my thoughts will have those contents including including my meta thoughts about what contents my thoughts have so so the externalism will run run through everything i'm thinking and bypass the problem of how do i know what contents my my thoughts have uh, and you had a similar worry about behavior so there's the ball out there the real ball and uh, uh, uh i act i intend to act on that ball that particular ball is is constitutive of my intention and my action but how can that be you say if uh all my uh, conscious states relate me to a quasi objects and quasi properties but i say no i say my conscious states relate me to the real ball I mean, that's their representational content. And so uh, to the extent my, my actions inherit the content of the thoughts behind them, my actions will be involved with the real ball. Uh, so, so again, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to as it were, uh, bypass the conscious properties involved in my having experiences and intentions and just look at their representational contents and think of those as as what uh, uh, gives gives uh, constitution to to my actions so in all the cases I, I i'd say you're you're pushing on to me a view that i don't have that somehow my uh, mental focus always has to start with the conscious goings on uh, that I can get at it prospectively. I say, I say no in in epistemology or uh, uh, thinking about the world generally or acting on the world. Uh, uh, my my thoughts and experiences are directed at the world. Uh, they're not directed at at their own conscious nature does that does that scratch your itch at all Roberto? Roberto you are muted as, as far as I understand you 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 account for for behavior intended behavior for 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 knowledge always appealing to the content uh, to the that for you always broad i have no problem with that um, but yeah. consciousness is not is only contingently associated with those contents so uh, the conscience that i have when i see uh, a ball the consciousness not the content is of something uh generic and not but not that that particular so uh, we, uh th th that's that sounds strange or to me because 
you account, you use the content, the broad content to account for the action. But that, that content, that very content, is not necessarily conscious. Uh, what, that, that can be the case. In many cases, we have broad contents that are not conscious. I, I, I don't uh, dispute that, uh, uh, this claim. My, my, my problem is that usually, usually, in normal cases, when I kick the ball, not, mm -hmm. my conscience goes and reaches the ball. The ball is present, that particular is present to my, my experience as a footballer. And for you, it's just a contingent fact. So, uh, uh, in other words, uh, consciousness, uh, that's my point, uh, my only point. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you are buying a, a, uh, such a thing as a epiphenomenalism, nothing is this, but, but the conscience as such, consciousness as such, plays no role, is, is, is dispensable. And that's, that sounds uh, odd to me. That's my point. My holy point is this. Well, I, I, I do think generally, I mean, I, I, would, mean, be, I, would, be, I would be very happy if in issues of epistemology and understanding the springs of action and so on, it didn't, the fact that certain states were conscious made no difference to my story. I'd be entirely happy about that. I think that uh, much thinking about consciousness overstates its importance. Uh, now, Patrick writes something about, about morality and treatment of animals and does it hinge on whether they're conscious? And, and my view there is this has got things completely the wrong way around, that uh, if we try and decide how to treat animals by trying to discover whether they're conscious or not, we're going to liable to do all kinds of horrible things. We should just think about the animals and what they can do and what they can't do, not worry about whether they're conscious, just get to appreciate how they are uh, and, and make the moral judgments on that basis. And maybe after that, you might, you might, find yourself counting them as conscious because you think they're worthy of moral respect, but that would be the other way around. So, uh, and if, if any of that sounds plausible, do you read, read Peter Godfrey Smith's most recent two books where he's very much uh, of the view that we'll stop worrying about consciousness once we know more about how different animals are structured. So I don't mind if, if it's a consequence of my view that the conscious status of certain states doesn't make any difference to their epistemological or action guiding significance. But having said that, I don't want, I mean, I would be unhappy if I ended up saying that uh, in typical cases uh, where people kick a ball, it's not a result of their being consciously aware of where the ball is. I mean, I do want to say that. I mean, it would be odd to, to deny that. And of course I do. I mean, I have a conscious state, right? And what's more, that conscious state represents for me where the ball is, the real physical ball. And it's in virtue of that that I succeed in kicking the physical ball. I want to say all that. All I want to deny is that somehow the ball is part of my conscious state. The physical ball is part of my conscious state. And Look, put like that, I hope nobody here is tempted to say, oh, no, the physical ball is part of my conscious state. So uh, uh, it can't be that in order to recover the things we naturally and rightly want to say that you kick the ball as a result of consciously uh, being aware of where it is. It can't be required in order to say that, that you end up with the physical ball being part of your conscious state. So I think I've got all the wherewithal I need to explain uh, how the conscious awareness of the ball uh, plays a role in my action. Well, uh, Sergio has a follow-up question. Okay, uh, thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, David, uh, I am working with uh, Roberto on uh, a book review about your uh, 
about the book. And I have shared his uh, interpretation that you buy uh, internism about sensor experience. So I would like to make you, if you could, you, you could make it more clear, at least to me. Because as I interpret your position, you are an externalist about mental content. You are a telesemanticist. You are, by, you are happy to say that uh, what we represent depends on the env environment where we are embedded, right? So, okay. But on the other hand, uh, you say uh, in several parts of the book that what fix the phenomenal properties of experience are the neurological features of, of the brain or the body maybe. Yeah. And, uh, and also that we could have the same phenomenal properties uh, in a given sense of experience, but representing different things be because we are embedded in different environments. Right. And now you say that uh, the case of the cosmic brain was just it was more to chop your uh, metaphysical conclusions, no. metaphysical point of view. But uh, we could change a bit the example and say, okay, maybe it's not just the brain that fix uh, the phenomenal properties of mm -hmm. the, the, the sensor experience. But since you say that uh, it is the vehicle that fix the sensory, uh, the phenomenal properties of experience, we could imagine like not a cosmic brain, but maybe the holy body uh, would be mm -hmm. the, the vehicle. And if that's the case, uh, I don't see how your position then doesn't uh, end up as a kind of internism about uh, phenomenal properties and in the sense that you take it to be phenomenal properties are narrow. So I, I, I'm a bit confused if you could help me here. I don't know how, how, how much you want to buy a position on this issue anymore. So that's the... Can we, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't gone through the whole book with this question in the front of my mind. But look, it's probably true, give or take a bit, that I think that conscious properties uh, supervene on internal brain neural properties uh but that's what i think but but am i committed to that in the book the one point i make at various points is i'm not even committed to physicalism that pretty much all these arguments would run just the same if you were a dualist and thought there was some kind of intrinsic mind stuffy properties that people had uh, so i'm not especially committed to physicalism for the purposes of the book also the argument that I give against representationalism is this argument about representational properties being abstract, but conscious properties being concrete. And that doesn't presuppose that the conscious properties are internal, are narrow. Uh, so I'm not sure how much I am committed in the book to this i'm just trying to think are there any other arguments that hinge on thinking that conscious properties operate inside inside the skin i don't i don't know uh, well so uh, yeah. i mean I, and as i said uh, there's an issue if you start thinking of phenomenal properties as narrow well you know how narrow is it is it just inside the cortex is it the whole brain does it involve the the whole nervous system, uh, what about the blind man with his stick? Uh, and I'm not particularly feeling that I ought to just stop with the cortex or the or the skin. Uh, I, I, I have no strong views about this. So I'm, I'm not sure that, <laughs> that the assumption of narrowness about null properties is playing any argumentative role in the book. Uh, Okay, um, Roberto has one last uh, uh, follow-up for this round. A simple question: uh, Would uh, the distinction from from Bloch between uh, phenomenal and assessed consciousness help you in some way? Because we could say the phenomenal consciousness is what it's all about in your book. Mm -hmm. Is something that. Uh, 
does not reach uh, particular digital purposes, etc. Mm -hmm. be neighbor or not. Uh, but asset consciousness uh, is is something different. And so, uh, but I don't think that you would, you would like to buy blocks distinction. Uh, I don't, I don't, you did it. Okay, that's my question. Uh, I don't think the help you're offering is one I want to accept. So you're suggesting that, that when I talk about conscious property, I mean phenomenally conscious and uh, uh, and uh, I'm not making the claims I'm making about access conscious. Uh, I'm 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 not very uh, bowled over by blocks distinction. I'm not sure that the notion of phenomenal consciousness, as opposed to access consciousness, is a good notion. I'm not sure it's a notion that we need. I would be very happy to do everything with some version of access consciousness but of course one has to be careful about exactly what counts as access but uh yeah i i think the whole idea about phenomenal consciousness different from access consciousness is is the source of a whole lot of problems in philosophy and uh so no i wouldn't want to appeal to that that distinction uh, in this context Thank you. Uh, let's go to the last round of the debate with the debaters. Afterwards, that I, as I said, we'll read some questions from the audience. Uh, uh, now is uh, Sergio Stern. Thank you very much, Sergio, for helping us and, and, and taking part of this. It's The word is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo, uh, Marco Aurelio, and Gabriel Mogabri. Mogabri. Gabriel, uh, for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here and uh, to discuss all these issues with David. It has been re a real pleasure to me. Okay, so, okay. Um, since I just have 10 minutes up to 15, I will, uh, I, I, I would have like a million of questions, but I want to focus uh, specifically, David, on the here and now argument. Okay, especially since uh, the last time that we discussed the the last, I think it was the last draft of the book uh, last year. This argument was not present on that version, and now it is in the final version. So it was one of the main difference that I noticed after reading the final version. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the here now argument. Okay, uh, so I want to understand uh, how the here and now argument is supposed to attack the what you call essential representationalism, okay? <laughs> Namely, the view that the relation between the representational and phenomenal properties of experience is necessary, in the sense that phenomenal properties are representational properties. So that's the target of the here and now argument, right? Mm -hmm. And you reject this view, the, your qualitative view rejects this view since you took the relation between representational and phenomenal properties to be contingent, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so one point that I fully agree that is problematic is that representationalism is committed to the claim that uh, the yellowness in my sensory experience mm -hmm. can be instantiated here and now, right? Even though maybe in hallucination or mm -hmm. uh, illusion, there, there is nothing yellow nearby. How is it possible? It's, mm -hmm. You put it as a kind of mystery, and, it, and indeed it, it strikes me that it is a mystery for, for the representationalists. So on, on this issue, I am on your side. And based, take it as the starting point of the here and now argument, you say that there is a mismatch, I'll call it here as a mismatch, uh, between the instantiation of the uh, phenomenal properties on one hand, right, and the instantiation of uh, representational properties, on the other hand. And, and what is this mismatch? Is that the instantiation of phenomenal properties, it, con uh, it constitutes a concrete local fact, the instantiations, they are concrete local facts on one hand, while instantiations of representational properties, they constitute abstract relational facts, right? Uh, and which, as such, cannot enter into causal relations. 
So uh, representational facts are abstract and local on one hand, while phenomenal facts are concrete and local. It is happening here and now. And only phenomenal facts uh, have uh, causal power. Uh, okay, so I, I will quote you now uh, as the structure of the argument, right? Because I will, I will press you on the second premise, <laughs> okay? Uh, so here's the here now argument. First, you say that first premise, instantiations of conscious sensory pro properties constitute concrete facts with cause and effects. Second premise, uh, instantiations of representational properties constitute abstract facts that cannot feature as cause or effects. In the conclusion, conscious uh, sensory pro properties are not representational properties. That's the here and now argument. Uh, I, I find that the argument prima facie, prima facie compelling but I think that there is two, there are two controversial assumptions of the argument. Uh, that at least how we, um, how I interpret it. I, I, I'm not sure that if you buy it as assumptions. So this is my first question: if I am interpreting your argument in the right way. So I take two, two uh, assumptions that uh, the argument makes. The first one is that the explanation of the instantiations of conscious properties must always be narrow and local. We are talking a bit on the narrow issue here, so that will be another opportunity for you to talk about it specifically in the, in the, in the, in the context of the here and now argument. Okay, so uh, why is it the case? So why the explanation of the instantiations of conscious properties must always be narrow and local? That's the first what I take to be uh, controversial assumptions. And the second one is that, I think it's a consequence on this assumption uh, anyway, that past uh, distal properties cannot feature as cause and effects since only local properties can do that. Uh, I, I want to understand it as well because it, strike, it strikes me as problematic to suppose that only local facts instantiated here and now where I am can account for the instantiation of conscious properties. Okay, so uh, ju just to illustrate these uh, two points, I want to uh, access here the, a case of a panic attack experience. Okay, uh, so suppose that whenever you um, you represent that you are going to have an imminent death, uh, you are having a panic attack. Okay, so what, and you can ask, okay, so I'm experiencing this panic attack. What's the cause of it? Oh, because I'm uh, experiencing an imminent death. Okay, uh, but what, what's causing this experience? How could an um, uninstantiated properties, the imminence of death, suppose that we're not about to die right now, okay, uh, cause that you have such hallucinatory experience of dying here and now. And now I want to contrast those two explanations that you can develop to explain uh, your panic attack experience as a consequence of the representation of imminent death, okay? So you can say, just say that, look, what happens is that you have a uh, pain in the chest, in your chest, and it triggers the local event of your panic attack experience. And your experience of pain attack, the hands is caused or triggered by the, by the fact that you are feeling a pain in your chest. Of course, this is a narrow explanation of the instantiation of your conscious properties of the panic attack, the feeling of it, because this explanation, it appears only to uh, present local events that accounts for the here and now instantiation of conscious properties, right? Okay. But uh, we are not usually uh, satisfied with this kind of explanation, right? Uh, we want to know more of why this pain in your chest causes you to represent or to have this feeling of imminent death and hence the feeling of uh, panic attack. Uh, after all, the majority of people that feel pain in the chest, they will not have the experience of a panic attack, right? Uh, 
So the question is why the here and now event of feeling pain in your chest causing uh, a panic attack experience. And I think that to fully explain this question, we need to appeal to a second kind of explanation, right? That I will call here a broad explanation. Uh, so let's just suppose that you had some traumatic events in your childhood that are behind this uh, pain in your chest causing you the uh, panic, panic attack, right? Together with that you had this bad luck in the, what Rawls used to call natural lottery, right? Because you had this, what the people call anxiety genes. So you have this past and distal events on one hand, a traumatic event in your childhood, and on the other hand, on, on the other hand what happened in the, uh, that you had these CFT genes, right? And both are, of course, past broad facts. And because of that, you made you to associate pain in the chest with imminent death that you ultimately causes the panic attack, okay? Uh, so this is a broad account for why the feeling of pain in chest triggers in you the panic attack ex experience, right? You are not now just looking at uh, the the what Gretzka used to call uh, triggering cause. Francisco mentioned it, right? Uh, but on the other hand, I think that we need a broad explanation as well because you, we we need what Gretzka used to call structuring causes, namely bad luck on the natural lottery, so that you have these anxiety genes or something that happened in your childhood. And I don't know if your view and the here now argument can, can give an account of this kind of broad explanation of, in this case, panic attack experience, but you can generalize to other kinds of cases, right? So just to finish uh, before Rodrigo complained, <laughs> uh, what I see as the problem is behind the second premise of the here now argument that looks problematic to me. Just to remember, this is the premise according to which instantiations of representational properties constitute abstract facts that cannot feature as cause or effects. I see, I, I want to press you on, on two points re regarding it. The first is that uh, the psychological explanation for the instantiation of phenomenal properties cannot be restricted to here and now facts. And I put this panic attack case as an illustration of this, of it, right? And the second is that when we provide a broad account for the instantiation of uh, conscious properties, we appeal to digital properties that are not instantiated here and now, but which are represented as such. This is the case of the imminent death that's not instantiated here now because I'm not about to die. Uh, so yeah, so these are two points that regarding the here now argument that I would like to hear more from you. First, if I have interpreted you right, maybe that's not the case. And if I do, uh, why it is not problematic or is not the consequence, et cetera. So thank you very much, David. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Very, very interesting. Uh, both good issues. Let me just get make sure I'm clear about uh, the panic attack example and the point. So the thought is this. Here, 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 here's somebody who, when they get a pain in the chest, thinks I am about to die and as a result has a panic attack. And your thought is surely this causal sequence hinges on the fact that their thought has the content, I'm about to die. That's not, uh, as it were, irrelevant to this chain of causation. Is, is, is that the thought? I mean, which is a good thought. Uh, yeah, yeah, let, I, I think so, yeah. Okay, good, good. That, that's, that's, that's a nice, a nice argument. Uh, let, so let me, let me talk about that a bit. So what I'm going to say is, at this point, I start to like Dretsky. 
Uh, and his distinction between triggering causes and, and structuring causes seems to me just the right thing to bring in here. So here's one story. Uh, here's this person, uh, perhaps from childhood experiences, who knows anxiety genes. They are so set up, they're inclined that whenever they have a pain in the chest, they will get into another brain state and this brain state is uh, will trigger, will, will cause a panic attack. And just think of this brain state as an internal state with a certain kind of neural structure. Uh, don't worry about its representation content. Okay, that's a story about how the panic attack is triggered and it says nothing about the content, representational content of the intervening state. Now, putting it like that, you might well feel, but surely the, the content of the intervening state is, is crucial here. It's not irrelevant to the fact that when you have a pain in your chest, you have a panic attack. And uh, I guess that's a strong intuition and, and surely I need to give some response to it. And the response I'll give is, Yes, that, that, that content is explanatory relevant, but not in respect of how this triggering chain of causation is going. With respect to that, it plays no role. Rather, the content is relevant in coming to understand why you were set up in the first place to respond to the pain in your chest with a thought that gives rise to a panic attack. Okay, having got this far, I'm not quite sure how the Dretskian will run this line and explain how the content did get you to be set up in in this way, in, in Dretsky's standard examples of structuring causes. It's obvious enough. It's not quite clear to me how you'd run the structuring causes story here. But Sergio, you're the one who mentioned Dretsky and structuring causes. So how, how, how did you think of it as going? How did the content matter to you're ending up well, in this uh, over anxious I'm not, disposition. I'm not sure how he he himself would uh, would try to give an account of this case. Uh, we were just inspired by by this distinction that you have both triggering causes like the pain in chest and at that very moment causing in you the panic attack, but the the whole causal story that doesn't end up there with this local and here now. Uh, fact you have to go back to your history personal history as well and look at look up at your genes or what happened in, in your childhood to explain as well why you have uh, why you have panic attacks after after pain at chest and what what i think is problematic for the uh, here now argument is that the here now argument seems to uh, restrict the explanation, the cause explanation, to the instantiations of ph phenomenal properties, to local and concrete facts. But what happened in your childhood, on one hand, and what happened uh, in the with, with your genes when you in the natural lottery, so you can have this anxiety genes, they, they are not local facts. Okay, look, let, 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 me, let me switch examples because I have thought about this a bit because, so, Michelle, who's, who's anybody here from Texas? Who's here from, no, so Michelle and, and Galen in the, in the background. Mark Sainsbury uh, read a lot of the book and had various queries and he liked it all fine, except he lit on just the same point as Sergio. And he said, look, if I shout out, look out at you and you jump out the way surely the content of what i said is not irrelevant to your response surely uh here's a chain of causation that hinges on the meaning of of the uh, of the shout and my thought was okay that's you know, that looks like a problem for my view and so here's what i'm going to say i'm going to say look uh it's just, it's just the shape of the words 
that make me jump out the way. I am now disposed that if somebody shouts those words at me, I will jump out the way. And uh, the, the meaning of the words uh, don't specially come into it, looking at this local triggering causal sequence. But if you want to know why it is that I'm disposed to jump out the way when somebody shouts those words, well, then the fact that those words are correlated with danger in the past is going to be uh, obviously part of the story. I've got to associate those words with, uh, well, I've, I've got to develop this response to those words because I've in the past associated those words with the presence of, of danger. So the correlation between those words and danger plays a part in the structuring explanation of my current setup. So, yeah, uh, it's not that the, the, the correlation between the words and the things they represent is irrelevant to everything, uh, but it's not part of the triggering story. So that's, that's the line I will take here. Uh, so does that answer the challenge, Sergio? What do you think? Uh, I'm not sure, <laughs> but okay. uh, okay. Uh, um, I'm not sure if that's compatible with your claim that consciousness is fully here now. But I, I don't want to. Uh, well, I will stop talking since there, there's some questions and. Okay, uh, so let, let me just go to your your first question about. Uh, when you set up the argument, the, the, the here and now argument, uh, you put it in terms of concrete local facts being causal and abstract non-local facts being not causal. Given what I said in response to Roberto earlier, I'm not so happy about the local fissuring in that story. I think of the, the final version of the argument with the three spelt out premises as in effect replacing this appeal to local and non-local with the distinction between concrete and abstract. And it's the concrete and abstract difference that does the work in the argument. You need to be a concrete factor entering causation and uh, uh, relations between people and properties as such, such as thinking of or having in mind and so on, those aren't concrete facts. It's only instantiations of properties that give us concrete facts. So, uh, so the, just, the, the, just, just one, one quick question, David. Yeah. So, okay, so you, you want to focus on the, not on the local uh, issue, but on the abstract against yeah. uh, concrete, concrete issue. Okay, but so a question, what happened in your childhood? It's not here now, okay, we agree. But is it abstract? Because it is ah. in the past and okay. it's not instantiated now. So it's not sure to me that it is not abstract. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> so point, right? we're, we're back to the, the, the appeal to Dretzky and, and the explanatory challenges being answered by looking at the structuring story, okay? The structuring story is a long causal story involving bits of history, and we haven't written it all out yet. And so I'm committed to the fact that when we've written it all out, we'll find a whole lot of concrete facts causing each other. And uh, I agree that it's a bit hand wavy to say that will all work out fine, but that's, that's the... So uh, you can see the description of a content to the thought I'm about to die or the shout, watch out, as pointing you to a, a structuring history of me, why I'm disposed as I am now, uh, where you're being pointed to causal relations involving concrete facts. That's, that's the, that will be the idea. Okay. Um, Roberto has a follow-up. My, my, my assumption is very simple. Let's take uh, for sake of argument that what is like to to have a panic, uh, panic, panic attack is just to represent uh, the imminent death. 
uh, that is representationalism. Let's take this for for sake of argument. Uh, now, the point is, you say the representation of something that is not instantiate cannot be a responsible cause and responsible for what has happened to me here and now. And the, uh, what I believe that Sergio is saying is that in the past, you have seen the property of, uh, of, of being about to death being instantiated, just uh, correlated with the pain in the chest. Now you feel the pain in chest, chest pain. At this moment, the uninstantiated prophet of imminent death plays a causal role in what is happening here and now in your consciousness. That's the point. So, uh, uh, in this case, if you assume, I'm not a representationalist, if you assume that what it's like to have a pain attack is just to represent the imminent death, that you are about to die, but people say this, that, mm -hmm. all the time. Even if you are representing now, hallucinating not because a uh, penny attack uh, experiences a kind of hallucination, you're not about to die, but you are representing an uninstantiated property mm -hmm. that in the past was, a, was, was instantiated. That's quite interesting. It was instantiated. You have a a, a bad uh, a PST experience, you saw your grandparents dying right after a heart attack, high after feeling pain in chest. It, it was instantiated in the past, but now it's not. Now you are hallucinating. But now this representation, assuming that representationalism is, uh, is true, just for sake of argument, mm -hmm. that plays a causal role in what has happened to you. That, uh, I believe that's the point, uh, or not to think. No. I'm not. I'm not clear about the example. Uh, I'm just trying to think about analogies with with words. Uh, so I'll, no, I'll, I'll just, it will just take me back to the Sainsbury case. So look, I agree, there's a strong thought which needs to be addressed that uh, the meanings of our words and our thoughts are not irrelevant to the causal roles they play. Uh, and uh, you know, we say the things we do, they affect people, uh, subsequently, because of what the words mean, uh, I mean that's that's a perfectly natural thought. So I need to give some some account of that. Uh, but I will do it in terms of uh, structuring explanations rather than doing explanations. So I'm, I'm I'm just repeating the same same point again. So I'm looking forward to your and Sergio's review, where you're going to get. <laughs> Get me on this we'll, issue. We will talk about it later. <laughs> thank you very much, David. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all. Uh, let us start the last part of, of our event when we'll take questions from the audience. I think, well, Marco Aurelio will read them. Some of them are from, from people of the organizing committee, I, I heard. Marco Aurelio, please, the word is yours. All right, so now I'm gonna, uh, we have two questions from the audience. I wanna first thank everybody watching us on YouTube and for sending the questions. And we also have a question from the co-organizer, one of the organizers of this event, uh, Professor Mograbi, Gabriel Mograbi, is gonna join us uh, shortly. So I'm gonna start with the first question from the audience. I'm just gonna share and read it loud. Uh, All right, uh, I'm gonna do it this way. So the first question is from uh, Eric Ramalho. He's a PhD candidate at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. 
the question is hard sciences, including biology and neurology, all hinge on representationalism for theories on the physical functioning of the mind. Physicalist theories and philosophy rely, even though of course not solely, on empirical evidence. How, if at all, could the physicalist theory of the philosophy of mind uh, accommodate the claim for anti-representationalism? And if that should be the case, how could it deal with hard evidence for representationalism of the kind empirical findings uh, repeatedly bear out? So that's the first question from uh, Eric uh, Amalio. So I'm gonna, uh, oh, do you want me to read the second one in a row and then you answer to both? Sure, sure, why not? Let's, let's, let's try that. The second one is a pretty broad question. Uh, I think you just want to check out what you think about it. It's just, can we understand that the mental process is the same in humans and other animals? Uh, Sebastian Silva. I think the, the question here is if they work the same way uh, and how related uh, they are. Uh, so those are the two questions from the audience. And before I pass the word to Gabriel Mograbi, who is already among us, uh, I'm going to let you answer to this uh, first two questions. Okay. Uh, I won't say a lot about this. Uh, my view is that sensory experiences and other mental states are indeed representations. I don't, I don't deny that at all. And uh, so I'm all in favor of the theories in biology and neuroscience that, that regard uh, sensory experiences and other mental states as representations. Uh, my, my view is just a view that I think, I think the neuroscientist biologists would be very happy with that uh, that the states inside the head, you can't read off what they represent just by looking inside the head. You have to see what states in the environment those states inside the head are correlated with and uh, uh, what kinds of actions they generate. Uh, and that will then show you what they mean. Uh, and I don't think there's anything in, in, in empirical science that uh, is inconsistent with the approach I I take so I think that answers answers that question. Uh, the other question was about humans and animals. Uh, my inclination is at first pass to suppose that humans and animals are very similar in respect of. Uh, sensory goings on but that the kinds of non-sensory thoughts we have uh, are perhaps peculiar to humans not shared by animals uh, and to a large extent facilitated by the fact that we humans are are linguistic creatures so so that means so that that's my general rough rough approach uh and it does it does mean that that uh uh it seems to me that theories of sensory experience should should work for animals as well as as humans uh but further aspects of human mentality that involve uh, cognition in the sense opposed to perception uh i don't think they apply to animals so right. Anybody else want to chip in on those two questions? Uh, yeah. um, well, I guess I'm going to have Gabriel. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So you can ask your question. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot for the very illuminating talk. That was a great talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you back after, I don't know, 15 years. I remember in the ASSC in Oxford, uh, yeah. I was just a, a grad student bothering you at the coffee break. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, my question goes in a similar direction to Sergio and uh, Roberto. 
so I, I, I have every at the beginning it was just a clarification, but as the, the bar as the debate uh, was you know heating up about uh, structuring and triggering causes and also the the limits of representationalism, uh, I'll add some 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 thoughts. So in the in the in the um, in the the second chapter, uh, which I think is the core of your argument against representationalism, you say uh, the possession of representational contents involves non-concrete relations between subjects and properties as such, mm -hmm. abstracted from their instances. Yeah. These by no means constitute here and now concrete causal facts. Yeah. How can they make a causal difference to anything? And then during your answer, uh, somehow you want to make a, a, a sharp difference between your view and other thinkers as Kriegel, as uh, lower, and you deny uh, intrinsic directness. Y you even say that intrinsic directness could be considered some sort of illusion. So mm -hmm. I, I want you to see how you mix those two subjects, this uh, kind of structural, um, the, the, the causal significance of this causal structure and the non-intrinsic directness. I mean, I have, I have worries about how we consider the difference between normal states of consciousness and hallucinations, considering that you deny uh, intrinsic directness as a, 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 a necessary condition for consciousness. Uh, because, I mean, somehow that suggests me that hallucinations would be just an epistemological problem. People are representing in a wrong way the, the outer world. Uh, and also, if denying the intrinsic uh, directness uh, in the sense used by Krieger and Lower, if that would not be a kind of uh, uh, a very expensive assumption, considering all the evolutionary evidence that we have, the way we relate to the, the environment, the way our history in terms of evolution shape us to cope with the environment it seems that this relationship is not a uh, contingent it's, it's a structural one that okay. those are my two simple questions but just to provoke some debate so look, there's a sense in which i don't deny what law or Kriegel or Cotty appeal to in uh, trying to make a case for intrinsic directedness. I do think sensory experience has this, this rich structure that make aspects of it seem mind independent, uh, inclines us to think of it as representational and I don't think it's an accident that it has this structure it has this structure precisely because uh, we've evolved brains that are good at tracking certain features of the environment so there is this structure and the structure is there uh, thinking in evolutionary terms so that we can represent features of the environment uh, but I just think that doesn't make it essentially representational. One could say all the same things about, well, I was about to say we can say all the same things about words, but it's not quite so obvious that we can say quite all the same things about words. Uh, but still, I mean, it's not an accident that words have the structure they do. They have the structure they do because that makes them very good at representing certain certain things uh, but nobody wants to say that words are intrinsically representational so uh, I'm just inclined to to rest my case with with that analogy you've got to do something more to to show that sensory experiences are essentially representational 
than to point to the rich structure they have and to observe that it's got that structure because they're designed to represent. That, that doesn't seem to me to be enough to show that they're essentially representational. It just shows that they're, they're states that are good for representing. And, and what is the something more? That would be what is the something more that they have to do to, 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 to make them a positive case of representation? What is the feature? Uh, that so, they so, so, so the essence of my argument is is nothing. I mean, I, uh, what what's more is needed is magic. I mean, uh, I look at all the things that you might bring in to explain why they're essentially representational, and I say that none of them. None of them do the job, uh, and we can we can manage perfectly well without committing ourselves to the view that sensory experience is essentially representational. Right. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, all right. So uh, now, I actually, I want to just add a last question uh, for myself, <laughs> and that's going to be a, a pretty short question. I just. Uh, First, I want to say that the, the book is fascinating, really. In my opinion, it's a really interesting book, well written, well uh, laid out, all the you know the arguments and topics. It's really fascinating. As a representationalist, and uh, I think, like, of course, as I read the book, I had to see where I would fit exactly in your criticism. And I found myself in many places in the book. Uh, but I have just one very direct question. I would like you to point your finger exactly to... Uh, what we representationalists are going to lose if we go your way. It's pretty much uh, the way you defend your the, this uh, relation between conscious experience and representational aspects uh, to be contingent. You seem like at the end to defend that that's going to be the best of the world. So we're going to have everything representationalists want. Uh, why not, right? Why not going that way? And my question is, why do you think representationalists uh, I mean, the core or resilient or the stubborn representationists. <laughs> Why do they uh, insist that this relation cannot be contingent? Why are they going to lose if they go your way? Uh, nothing. I, I, well, I mean, I'm going to say nothing. I'm going to say that <laughs> uh, all that will happen is that you will free yourself of a lot of nasty problems that you don't need. I mean, come in, the water's, the water's lovely, uh, is my view. And uh, what have we seen that representationalists, essential representationalists, find themselves being forced to have sensory experiences representing funny, response-dependent properties, uh, we find them being forced to deny that experiences have all kinds of broad contents. It's perfectly natural, suppose they do have. And it seems to me that all these all these costs are being paid for nothing very good except a prior commitment, I mean, which perhaps goes back a long way in the history of philosophy, to the idea that you can read off the representational content from certain conscious states from their conscious nature. It just seems to me that's a that's a mistake. Uh, we be do well to free. We do well to be free of. Cathy uh, uh, has a follow-up question to this yeah. last question. Well, I just wanted to say that I, I think the representationalists will feel, or some representationalists will feel that they lose something. I think several people were trying to articulate that worry here. Is that you somehow lose the sense that you are actually aware of the world in consciousness? So, um, and it's 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 not it's not something very tangible, um, but um, this idea that perception opens us to the world, and then the world itself appears to us in perception, and we take in the world while we're having a conscious experience. I think that is lost. And well, um, I, I, I agree that. And I think I think people will regret that, and and maybe maybe this is the price you pay for you know, um, not being boggled down by uninstantiated properties and all that all that sort of thing. But I think there is a loss there. Yes. Uh, I mean, I do say in the book that I feel I'm entitled to the locution that I am aware in sensory experience of worldly objects out there. I mean, I, I am not prepared to concede that the 
pre-theoretical notion of awareness requires that you're only aware of things that are part of your consciousness. That seems to me a slightly weird idea. But that, that's just a terminological point. I agree that that alternative views, naive realism, and to some extent representationalism, uh, put the mind in contact with the world in a way that, that my qualitative view doesn't. Uh, so, yes. Uh, the question is whether that that thought, that hankering, can be made good at all. And then, my, my, I mean, I, I say at the beginning of the book, my, my view is ugly. It, it's, it's ugly precisely in this respect that it doesn't, it doesn't have sensory experience as some kind of bridge from the mind out into the world. Uh, but I think that the metaphysical costs of trying to, to, to have that are just too great. But all right, so I, I take it back. Something, something attractive is lost by turning away from representations. Now, one, one further thought. If, if, if you really had the sanctuary, uh, you really wanted to satisfy it, you'd probably be better off as a naive realist than a representationalist. It's not, it's not clear how far representationalism gets you uh, into contact with the world as it is itself. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think, I think representationalist is as good as as, as naive realist. I mean, I, um, but but I, but but naive realism has an absolute uh, rhetorical advantage there. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I can see it. I mean, yeah, uh, my my uh, lack of concern about this goes back to to my responses to Roberto earlier. I I don't think. I mean, I, I've got views about about epistemology, about uh, uh, possibility of reference and so on, which don't depend on, on uh, consciousness playing any special, any special role. So I, I, I'm not specially worried that, that uh, uh, conscious experience doesn't put us in touch with the world, but I can see people who are committed to the idea that, that that knowledge requires some kind of uh, direct contact might feel differently. Well, uh, Marco Aurelio and, and Roberto have follow-up questions. I think this should be the last ones. And, and mm -hmm. well, if, if it is okay for you, David, uh, may I? I'm, I'm fine, but uh, yeah, uh, other people have their families and so Let's not go in too long. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. That's a follow-up. I mean, we're gonna just gotta go five minutes past the three hours we uh, scheduled here. But I mean, it's very short. Uh, when I asked the, that question, of course, I had something in mind, yeah. and one of the things uh, was just what uh, uh, Kathleen just said. Mm -hmm. uh, there is this direct, uh, realist mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, intuition that they want to save, and it seems to be lost somehow, or at least mm -hmm. in a. In, in hot water now. I don't know how you're going to save it later. But uh, that's one point. And the other point uh, maybe has to do with uh, representationalism as an account of the very you know, metaphysical, you know, uh, fundamental nature of what conscious, uh, conscious experience or consciousness is all about, or mm -hmm. the conscious properties and all that. If the relation is contingent, something very important seems to be uh, out of the picture now. I think the, the, the reason why they resist uh, uh, going contingent in the relation between, you know, uh, consciousness and uh, content, you know, uh, is that uh, if you if you go contingent, you don't really have a, a constitutive account of what consciousness is all about. And I, I think that representation is, is basically a theory about that, right? Uh, or at least in the in the deepest metaphysical level, it has a claim of of that nature, uh, which is going to be lost. But I, I don't want to uh, press this point. I, I'm just, uh, I want to know what we're going to be uh, uh, leaving out if we go your way. And I think a lot. Maybe it's a really well, kind of hard stroke on, on representation. It's not like some minor change. It seems like the whole thing has to be reshaped. There's a point Cotty made. There's, there's the strong intuition, which is deeply ingrained in our philosophical history, I think, that that you can just read off from conscious states uh, what they're saying. Uh, I'm not sure the last thing you said is a great loss. I mean, you said that we'd lose the possibility of one kind of explanation of consciousness. So there's people like 
Chaim Gretzky that wants to start with the naturalist account of representation and explain consciousness in terms of that. Uh, that's not a kind of general program. It's a rather particular approach to consciousness. And, and I think the arguments in my book show that it really is a, a non-starter. So uh, I don't think that's a great loss. Right. Uh, Robert. Just following up, uh, uh, I believe that what uh, uh, we lose if you are representationalist or naive realist mm -hmm. is the very idea that uh, uh, consciousness has a place in nature, has a clear place, a clear uh, role to play in, in nature. Uh, because uh, the representation of course do all the job, all the work. Yeah. I'm the question with why? in the how we are conscious creature. What is the gain? Because uh, a zombie could do uh, as well as we do. Uh, consciousness is something that uh, comes uh, uh, without purpose, without uh, biologically speaking, evolutively speaking, without the function, without, that's what, that's impression from the side of Representationalist. I am not one of them. Just that. So I agree that many people will feel that, that part of what's wrong with my view is is it's not giving any special explanatory role to consciousness. But that doesn't bother bother me. Uh, I think people think all wrong about consciousness. I think that that most people who think about consciousness are thinking in implicitly dualist terms. They think there's an extra thing over and above the physical goings on, and that this makes some causal expansion difference in the world. I think that's just all a terrible, a terrible mistake. I mean, I'm inclined the other way around. If, if I find somebody explaining something uh, interesting in terms of it's conscious, and therefore that's why it happens. I'm well. I'm not inclined to reach for my gun, but I'm uh, 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 very suspicious at that point. I, I think, how can the fact that something is conscious make an explanatory difference? Surely, uh, uh, consciousness is going to supervene on various physical and structural goings on, and they're the things that make the explanatory difference. Uh, so, I, I, I do think that people who think that, that a state's being conscious makes a big difference to something, uh, either causally or expansively or philosophically, uh, I'm just inclined to accept that. I, I always think that's a mistake. Uh, I, I, I think that, sure, people are conscious, animals are conscious, uh, but that's not something extra to, to physical, structural goings on. And anything that can be explained in terms of consciousness can equally well be explained without, without mentioning consciousness. Uh, so I, I've got quite a hard line on, on uh, the intuition that, that Roberto is pushing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, Gabriel asked for a very last follow-up question. Uh, okay, uh, I, I am I am a sheer physicalist, and I believe conscious has a causal role. Uh, let's try to make a very um, simple example to show that I go to I, I go to a fair market, mm -hmm. and I want to pick up tomatoes, and I mean depending on, on what plate I will cook. I'll, I'll select my tomatoes in different yeah. ways, right? Uh, if I want to do like a pomodoro sauce, probably I'll got, you know, ripe tomatoes. If I want to do a salad, I'll go for greener tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the sensory uh, features of those tomatoes, the color, uh, the consistency, the, the tactical consistency and the smell that will guide my selections. But if okay. I was not aware of the type of the plate I will produce, I'll, I'll not be effective in my selection. So, I mean, I, 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 okay, well, okay, let, let, I mean, I, I agree entirely. Of course, conscious stakes make a causal difference. I mean, I'd be mad to deny that. Many of them do. Uh, uh, all I want to say is, is, is they don't make a causal difference because they're conscious. I mean, I, uh, uh, okay. I mean, the, the states that they are, they make a causal difference and they're conscious, but it's not like they're being conscious, gives them some extra kind of super super fuel that makes them go faster. That's the wrong way to think about it. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm glad of that. I, I, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm uh, watching the button. Yeah, of course. I would like to to thank you, David, for uh, enduring this battery of questions with very very generous and clear answers. Uh, I would like to thank you and, and, and the other guests for accepting this whole idea. I, I, in my view, it was an extraordinary debate. And I think people are quite excited to read your, your new book. Mm -hmm. I, at least uh, I am quite excited to finish reading it. Um, thank you all. It was, it was very good. We'll have probably a, a, another Mind Brazil brainstorms in, in two months. So uh, just just wait for our for our news. And could thank you I, very much. Could I thank yes. everybody too? I, I really thank you, Rodrigo, for, for hosting this. Thank you to the organizers for putting this on. I'm very, very grateful. And thank you to all the symposiums for all your questions and thoughts and patience. Uh, it's very, very good of you. Thank you. Thank you all. So have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, David. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I hope to see you all individually soon. Good. Bye. Hopefully. <laughs>